In 1898, the British Egyptologists James Quibble and Frederick Green uncovered a sculpted slab of grey wacker, a greenish-grey slate-like stone, in the ruins of an early temple at the upper Egyptian site of Hierakonpolis. Unlike the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb 24 years later, this find would not bring the world's journalists racing to the scene, but its discoverers were almost immediately aware of its importance. Like the Rosetta Stone, this carved slab, the Nana Palette, would have powerful repercussions for the study of ancient Egypt, spreading far beyond its immediate significance at Hierakonpolis. For the next century or so, it would be variously interpreted by Egyptologists attempting to solve numerous different problems, from the political origins of the Egyptian state to the nature of Egyptian art and writing. No single object can necessarily typify an entire culture, but the Nana Palette is one of a few surviving artifacts from the Nile Valley that are so iconic and so rich in information that they can act as microcosms of certain aspects of ancient Egyptian culture as a whole. The Nana Palette The Nana Palette is a shield-shaped slab of grey wacker. 63 centimetres high, with carved low-relief decoration on both faces, and it is usually dated to the final century of the 4th millennium BC. On the front, there is a depiction of intertwined long-necked lions, serpipods, held on leashes by two bearded men. Symmetrical pairs of tamed beasts, such as these, seem to be adapted from early Mesopotamian, perhaps Elamite iconography. In an Egyptian context, however, they may specifically represent the enforced unification of the two halves of the country, which is a theme in Egyptian art and texts throughout the Pharaonic period. The circle formed by the entwining necks of the serpipods ingeniously creates the depression or saucer in which pigments for eye paint might have been crushed, the original purpose of these palettes but it is unclear whether such significant ceremonial artefacts as the Nama Ballad were ever actually used for this function. Highly charged ritual objects such as these perhaps transcended the supposed function of the thing itself as they took on the role of offerings dedicated to the Hierocombinus temple. On other ceremonial palettes of similar type, the secular depression can have the unwanted effect of interrupting the smooth flow of the scenes depicted. Compare, for instance, the two dog palette, also excavated by Quibble and Green at Hierocompolis, where there are once again two long-necked lions on the front, but the depression simply sits between the necks rather than being created by them, or the battlefield palette, where the depression interrupts a row of captors. In the top register on the front of the palette, above the two serpipods, the artist has carved the striding bearded figure of an early Egyptian ruler, probably identified as a man called Nana, judging by the hieroglyphs both in front of him and in the serac frame in the centre of the top of the palette, between the two cow's heads. He is shown wearing the so-called red crown, which is first attested on a potshed dating to the Nakada I period, circa 3800 to 3600 BC, and eventually became connected with the control of Lower Egypt, but whether it had yet developed this association in Nakada I, or even in the reign of Nana, is uncertain. He is also carrying a mace and a flail, and wearing a tied tunic over his left shoulder, with a bull's tail hanging from the waist. The king is taking part in a procession with six other people, including two figures about half his size, who are situated behind and in front of him on the pallet, but are perhaps intended to be regarded as walking on either side of him in reality. These two men, both clean-shaven, evidently represent high officials. The one to the left is clearly a sandal-bearer, an actual title held by some eminent royal officials in later times, since he carries a pair of sandals in one hand and a small vessel in the other, while the pectoral, or perhaps royal seal, is tied around his neck by a cord. A single hieroglyph in a rectangular frame or box is placed behind and above his head, this sign, perhaps being a representation of a reed float, like those used by old kingdom hunters of hippopotami, but of uncertain meaning in this context, is usually rendered phonetically as DB3. He also has two different signs hovering in front of his head, 
apparently a superimposed rosette sign and the HM sign that later came to have several meanings, including servant. The official to the right is represented as a slightly larger scale and is shown wearing a wig and a leopard skin costume as well as possibly writing equipment slung around his neck. He may be identified by two hieroglyphs above his head spelling the word TT, perhaps an early version of the word for vizier. The king and these two officials, along with four smaller standard bearers, all but one of whom are shown bearded, are evidently reviewing the decapitated and castrated bodies of ten of their enemies. These corpses are laid out on the far right, each with his head between his legs, and all but one with the severed phallus of the deceased placed on his head. This review of the enemy dead is presumably in the aftermath of a battle or an act of ritual slaughter. The four standards are topped by symbols or totems which are known from later periods, comprising two falcons, one jackal, perhaps the god Wepwawet, and a strange globular item that is clearly the shed shed or royal placenta. These standards, taken together, form a group that were later identified as the so-called followers of Horus, or the gods who follow Horus, who had strong associations with the celebration of a royal jubilee or funeral. Above the corpses are four signs or images, a door, a falcon, a boat with high prow and stern, and a falcon hole in a harpoon. On the other side of the pallet is a much larger, muscular, striding figure of Nana, this time shown wearing the conical white crown of Upper Egypt, along with the same tunic tied over his left shoulder and the bull's tail hanging from his waist, as well as fringes ending in cow's heads. On this occasion he is accompanied only by the sandal-bearer, behind him or to one side, depending on how we interpret the use of perspective here, while he smites an enemy with a pear-shaped mace held up above his head. The mace is held slightly oddly, halfway up the handle. The sandal-bearer is again shown at just under half the size of the king, although the ruler's tall crown makes him tower even more over the rest of the figures in the scene. Once more, the sandal bearer has the rosette and HM signs by his head. The king is ripping the hair of the captive, whose facial features seem Egyptian rather than Libyan or Asiatic, and the latter has two ideograms floating to the right of his head. These two small images are presumed by most Egyptologists to be the early hieroglyphs for harpoon and lake, which would either phonetically spell out the foreign name, Mwash, or refer to someone whose name, title, or even place of origin was actually Harpoon Lake. It seems likely that the falcon owl in a harpoon, depicted as one of the group of enigmatic signs above the decapitated bodies on the front of the pallet, is also communicating the idea of the defeat of Wash Harpoon by the kin in the guise of the Horus Falcon. In front of the king and above the captive, the falcon god Horus hovers, holding eschematically rendered captive by a rope attached to the man's nose. This captive has six papyri protruding from his back, and it's been suggested that this identifies the rebus as 6,000 captives, on the basis that each of the papyrus plants already signifies the number 1,000, as they later would in the pharaonic period. An alternative reading is that this group of plants is an iconographical reference to the homeland of the captive, which might have been the papyrus-filled land of northern Egypt. It's possible that the harpoon and lake signs may be intended to refer to the king's captive as well as to the one held by the falcon, so that both may actually be the same person or people. In the lowest section of this side of the pallet are two prone naked human figures, who are presumably also intended to be either captives or dead enemies. Each of these has a sign to the left of his face, and both of their bodies are twisted so that their faces are pointing leftwards, that is, in the same direction as the earlier two captives, and in the opposite direction to the king and the sandal bearer. The visual appearance and the very complex content of the Nana palette's decoration have been the subject of constant discussion ever since its discovery.
The style of the images and the identification of the kin Yasnana demonstrate that it was created at the end of the 4th millennium BC, when many of the most distinctive elements of Egyptian culture were emerging and Egypt was essentially moving from prehistory to history. The images already incorporate a number of highly charismatic features of pharaonic art, such as the arrangement of the picture into a series of horizontal registers. The semi-diagrammatic depiction of people and animals is a combination of frontal and sideways elements, and the use of size as a means of indicating each individual's relative importance. The latter is very much the iconography of power. In a cross-cultural study of the palace, the Canadian archaeologist Bruce Trigger points out that the specific Egyptianness of the smiting scene can be counterbalanced by various aspects of the iconography that seem to be universal. Noting the obvious contrast between the king's elaborate regalia and his virtually naked victim, he cites the steel of vultures, excavated from the ancient Mesopotamian city of Gyusu, and now in the Louvre, early dynastic three period, circa 2560 BC, on which the local god Ningyasu wields a mace over a group of naked enemies trapped in a net. In a further parallel to the Nanapalat's iconography, the other side of this steel portrays Ianatan, the Ensi, ruler of Lagash, trampling defeated enemies underfoot while vultures devour their severed heads. Trigger also makes a fascinating comparison with a Maya scene on a carved lintel from Yak's Chilan, showing a ruler called Bird Jaguar capturing two of his enemies, around AD 755. In the Maya scene, the richly clothed triumphant warriors contrast with the semi-naked defeated runas, one of whom is held by his hair. As Trigger concludes, Although the scene on the Nama Palette does not necessarily depict the capture in battle of an adversary, the psychological affinities between these two representations are very close, notwithstanding their having evolved wholly independently of one another in different hemispheres and far removed in time. This comment might be applied in some respects to Egyptian culture as a whole, where we find ourselves constantly veering between the thought that they're just like us and the alternative view that they're also very peculiarly and distinctively Egyptian. As Barry Kemp says in Ancient Egypt, Anatomy of a Civilization, much recommended as a longer introduction to Ancient Egypt, I'm trying to be an objective observer, examining evidence from ancient Egypt as if I were a botanist looking at species of ferns. Yet I can only make sense of the evidence by accepting that I myself am a part of it, and how I join up the fragments depends on the fact that I am human too, living within my own cultural sphere. There is no clear and absolute answer as to where the line should be drawn between too much empathy and too little. If the attraction of ancient Egyptian culture is its combination of exotica and familiarity, the role of the Egyptologist seems to be to use the available archaeological, visual and textual sources to distinguish between, on the one hand, aspects of life that are culturally specific either to ourselves or to the ancient Egyptians, and, on the other hand, key characteristics of humanity and behaviour that transcend place and time. This is, of course, not the only reason for studying the civilization of ancient Egypt, although it is this kind of mindset that constantly challenges us to view Egypt not in isolation, but as one of many human cultural responses to particular environmental and historical conditions. The earliest known Egyptians, if we can call them this before Egypt existed as a cultural or ethnic phenomenon, are attested in Paleolithic northeastern Africa in circa 400,000 BC. The first evidence of tools takes the form of long stone hand axes, but the earliest actual human remains, the body of a child found at Taramsa Hilton in southern Egypt, are about 55,000 years old. Between these two dates, that is, 400,000 to 55,000 BC, Egypt passed through the long, lower and middle Paleolithic periods of human prehistory. The presence of early hominins, initially Homo erectus and later Homo sapiens, is attested by scattered stone toolkits surviving in the eastern part of the Sahara, now occupied by Egypt.
These hunter-gatherers survived through long periods of hyperaridity, alternating with much shorter phases when wetter conditions prevailed. For example, stratified deposits at the site of Sodman Cave, located in the central eastern desert, show occupation from the Middle Paleolithic to the Neolithic. During the Mesolithic period, circa 10,000 to 5,000 BC, a number of semi-nomadic cultures inhabited the immediate area of the Nile Valley, relying on hunting and fishing for their subsistence. Finally, from about 6,000 BC onwards, the climate of northeastern Africa became gradually wetter, encouraging the development of more subtle communities along the Nile, primarily relying on animal and plant domestication. Excavation of these semi-permanent settlements, such as Wadi Gabanya in the Aswan region, have revealed intensive evidence of plant processing in many domestic settings. By the beginning of the 4th millennium BC, settled communities had emerged at the northern end of the Nile Valley. Rainfall was, and still is, very low throughout the region, so the rich agricultural land of Egypt was watered by the river's annual flooding or inundation, which deposited new layers of fertile silt along the riverbanks. The strips of cultivated land vary in thickness on either side as the river meanders northwards. The River Nile, stretching from its sources in eastern and central Africa down to the Mediterranean coast, is therefore the single most important element in the geography of Egypt. Egyptologists tend to divide the country into two sections, largely derived from textual sources. First, Upper Egypt, the southern part, consisting of the land from Wadi Halfa to Cairo, and second, Lower Egypt, in the north, where the Nile fans out into several branches, forming a large and fertile delta before disgorging into the Mediterranean. The textual sources also suggest that ancient Egyptians called their country Kemet, black land, referring to the black fertile soil, in contrast to the surrounding Deshret, red land or desert. Within this geographical setting, a sophisticated culture steadily emerged. The archaeology of pharaonic Egypt spans three millennia, circa 3100 to 332 BC, and encompasses a diverse body of artifacts, architecture, texts, and organic remains. Museums throughout the world contain millions of Egyptian antiquities, and even a greater number of remains are still in situ in the Nile Valley and the Delta, ranging from temples, tombs and cities to remote rock inscriptions carved on crags in the Libyan Desert, the Eastern Desert or the Sinai Peninsula. Three principal factors have facilitated the survival of an unusual wealth of detail concerning pharaonic Egypt. First, an elite group's penchant for grandiose and elaborate funerary arrangements. Second, suitably arid conditions of preservation. And finally, the use of writing on a wide variety of media. The history of the rediscovery of ancient Egypt is, in many respects, the same as that of any other early civilization, in that centuries of ignorance and plundering were gradually replaced by the more enlightened approaches of late 19th century and 20th century scholars. Within this broad trend, however, various specific aspects of the study of ancient Egypt, such as epigraphy, excavation, philology and anthropology, have progressed at very different rates. The first people from outside Egypt to show interest in studying the Egyptians as a unique and fascinating anthropological phenomenon were the ancient Greeks. Although archaeological evidence in Egypt and elsewhere shows that there were commercial contacts between Egyptians and Greeks from at least the late 3rd millennium BC, it was the recruitment of large numbers of Greek mercenary soldiers by the 26th dynasty ruler Santek I in the 7th century BC that probably marked the beginning of full-scale contact between the two civilizations. Between the 5th century BC and the 2nd century AD, Numerous Greek and Roman scholars visited Egypt, and the accounts that they gave of their visits provide our first real verbal and intellectual view of Egypt from the outside. Sadly, however, the works of many ancient writers on Egypt have not survived. One major reason for this was the burning of the library at Alexandria in 47 BC, and then again in AD 391, when 700,000 works, including Menefo's 36-volume History of Egypt, were lost.
The best known and most informative ancient Greek visitor to Egypt was of course Herodotus of Halicarnassus, the traveller and historian. His nine volumes of histories were written between 430 and 425 BC, and the second book is entirely devoted to Egypt. Herodotus is the earliest major textual source of information on mummification and other ancient Egyptian religious and funerary customs, and he attracted numerous later imitators, including Strabo and Diodorus Siculus. His travels in Egypt may have extended as far south as Aswan, but he gives no detailed account of Thebes, concentrating mainly on places in Lower Egypt. He seems to have relied mainly on rather low-ranking Egyptian priests for his evidence, but his astute observations included the identification of the pyramids as royal burial places. Herodotus not only provides a great deal of ethnographic information on 5th century Egypt, but also gives us a version of Egyptian history for about 200 years of the late period, from the reign of Santet I, circa 650 BC, to the date that Herodotus visited Egypt, circa 450 BC, by which time Egypt had become a satrapy in the Persian Empire. Occasionally, archaeological work has shown Herodotus' descriptions to be surprisingly accurate, as in the case of Talbasta, the site of the temple and town of Bubastis, in the eastern Nile Delta, about 80 kilometers to the northeast of Cairo. In 1887-9, Edouard Naville's excavation of the main monument at the site, the Red Granite Temple of the Cat Goddess Bastet, confirmed many of the architectural details of the Greek historian's report. Indigenous Egyptian texts of the 5th century BC, although quite extensive, are to a large extent full of stereotyped obsolescent material that cannot be regarded as reliable in modern historical terms. Herodotus, however, is not without his own problems, and arguably presents a view of Egyptian history that has been deliberately fashioned to suit Greek tastes and ideas. Not only that, but it was demonstrated in 1887 by the German philologist Hermann Diels that Herodotus was extensively plagiarizing the work of his illustrious predecessor, Hecateus of Miletus, who is known to have visited Egypt in about 500 BC. It has consequently been argued that Hecateus deserves at least some of the credit for developing the basic intellectual framework that characterized Herodotus and most later Greek authors writing about Egypt. Some Greeks were in the Nile Valley purely for commercial or military reasons, or just passing through, and these individuals have left behind some of the earliest tourist and pilgrimage graffiti on the sites and monuments that they visited. One of the best collections of this kind of graffiti is on the northernmost of the Colossi of Memnon, two colossal statues that stand in front of the remains of the 18th century mortuary temple of Amenhotep III on the west bank at Thebes. The Greeks knew the statue as the vocal Memnon, interpreting the unusual whistling noise it made each morning as the Homeric character Memnon singing to his mother Eos, goddess of the dawn. Even in the remote 19th dynasty temples of Ramesses II down at Abu Simbel in Nubia, there are graffiti left by Carian, Greek and Phoenician soldiers who formed part of Samtek II's expedition against the Kushites in the early 6th century BC. The Greek historian Strabo, who spent several years at Alexandria in the late 1st century BC, discusses several of the Theban monuments, including the Colossi and the New Kingdom rock tombs. Although not generally as informative as the work of Herodotus, and considerably more prone to patronizing remarks concerning Egyptian culture, Strabo's geography is nevertheless a valuable record of Egypt in the 1st century BC. Herodotus and his successors provide us with information about Egypt in the late period and Greco-Roman times, but they also help to give us a sense of the intellectual and spiritual concerns of Egyptians. Although the Greek and Roman writers frequently seem to have been wrong in their assessment of the Egyptians' religion and philosophy, their reactions often involve the same kind of complex mixture of responses that are evoked in many modern researchers. There can be no doubting the presence of Greeks and Romans in Egypt, but attempts to correlate biblical narratives with the Egyptian textual and archaeological record have often been distinctly problematic. 
Most scholars' efforts to assign precise dates to biblical episodes involving Egypt tend to be thwarted by the uncertainty of the chronological background of the Old Testament. It also seems likely that many events of great significance to the Israelites cannot be assumed to have had the same importance to the ancient Egyptians. Therefore, there is no guarantee of any independent Egyptian record having been made, let alone being one of the very small proportion of texts that have actually survived. Definite datable references to Egypt do not seem to appear in the Bible until the first millennium BC, when there are a number of specific allusions to the Egyptians, particularly in connection with battles against the Assyrians and Persians. It may have been during the reign of the 21st dynasty ruler Osorkon the Elder, circa 980 BC, that Haddad the Edomite, an adversary of Solomon, is mentioned in 1 Kings chapter 11, stayed in Egypt. The 22nd dynasty ruler, Shoshank the I, 945-924 BC, is almost certainly the biblical Shishak, who is said to have pillaged Jerusalem and the Temple of Solomon in 925 BC. About two centuries later, the Egyptian prince Tefnut of Sais is alleged to have been the So king of Egypt, contacted by Azir, the ruler of Samaria, when he was looking for military aid in his struggles against a Syrian invasion. 2 Kings chapter 17. However, these very specific references to named rulers are highly exceptional cases, and generally speaking, provable links between ancient Egypt and the Old Testament narrative are controversial and heavily debated. Since most of the events described in the Bible occurred several hundred years before the time that they were written down, it's extremely difficult to know when they are factual historical accounts and when they are purely allegorical or rhetorical in nature. Further potential problems occur because of anachronistic Egyptian names, places, or cultural phenomena that may not belong to the time when the events are supposed to have happened, but to later periods when the texts were actually written down. This may be the case, for instance, with the story of Joseph, Genesis chapter 37 to 50, which is usually assumed to have taken place in the New Kingdom, 1550 to 1070 BC, but contains certain details that tie in much more with the Egyptian political situation of the Sayite period, 664 to 525 BC. Probably the most frequently discussed biblical link with Egypt is the Exodus story, there is a popular assumption that Ramesses II, whose overall reputation is discussed in chapter 5, was the pharaoh involved in the expulsion of the Israelites from Egypt. The evidence linking Ramesses specifically with the Exodus story is fairly slim, hinging partly on the statement in Exodus book 1 chapter 11 that the enslaved Israelites were put to work at the cities of Python and Ramesses, the latter perhaps to be identified with Pyramesi a site founded by Ramesses and his father in the eastern delta. It has also been pointed out that Ramesses' eldest son, Amenhotep appears to vanish from the records fairly early in his father's reign, leading some scholars to suggest that he might have died young and thus might be a theoretical candidate for Pharaoh's slaughtered firstborn in the Exodus narrative. However, Farouk Goma argues that this son might simply have changed his name to Amun Her Win MF or Seth Her Kepeshef, both of which continue to appear in texts until fairly late in Ramesses' reign. If Goma is correct, this particular son would therefore still be alive in the fortieth year of Ramesses II's reign, thus suggesting that he was perhaps in his fifties when he died, making him a much less plausible candidate for the slaughtered firstborn. Sadly, Gaman was about half a century too late to prevent Cecil B. DeMille from casting Ramesses as the villain in his celebrated silent movie, The Ten Commandments, 1923. The same applies to the 1990s DreamWorks Exodus set animation, Prince of Egypt, and Ridley Scott's Exodus, Gods and Kings, released in 2014, in both of which Ramesses was once again in the hot seat. Some Egyptologists have suggested that the pharaoh of the Exodus was actually Ramesses' son and successor, Meremtah, partly on the basis of a victory steal from the latter's reign that is the earliest document of any kind to mention Israel. Dating to the fifth year of his reign, circa 1208, it consists of a series of hymns celebrating Meremtah's victories over various foreign enemies.
among the Palestinian enemies is the word Israel, significantly accompanied by a hieroglyph that indicates a people rather than a town or geographical area. Plundered is Canaan with every evil, carried off is Ashkelon, seized upon is Giza, Yanoan is made as that which does not exist, Israel is laid waste, his seed is not, Huru has become a widow for Egypt, all lands together, they are pacified. However, as this translated extract shows, the steel actually tells us very little about the origins or nature of Israel, and certainly makes no reference to the presence of Israelites in Egypt, let alone their expulsion. In fact, Merentos steel may not even be the earliest Egyptian reference to Israel, as an inscription on a fragment of an 18th dynasty statue pedestal in Berlin seems to mention Israel as an ethnic group nearly two centuries earlier. Queen Hatshepsut, in the early 18th dynasty, has also been suggested as the Exodus Pharaoh, on the somewhat dubious grounds that the parting of the waters of the Red Sea could then be explained as the result of the volcanic eruption on the island of Sandorini in the Aegean, which was thought to coincide with her reign. However, most recent estimates of the date of the Santorini eruption set it at about circa 1620, about 150 years before Hatshepsut's reign. The Canadian Egyptologist Donald Redford argues more radically that the Exodus account is simply a mishmash of stories, which probably originated in distant memories of the expulsion of the Hyksos, the Asiatic kings who ruled northern Egypt during the Second Intermediate Period. In Moses the Egyptian, Jan Asman suggests that it represents not only a folk memory of the end of the Hyksos period, when Egypt expelled Asiatic rulers from northern Egypt, but perhaps also a kind of mythologization of the so-called heretical Lanmana period. He concludes that the Exodus story is ultimately to be regarded as a convenient use of such folk tales to allow the Israelites to define themselves as a distinct nation. An intriguing direct literary and perhaps religious link between Egypt and the Bible is the so-called Hymn to the Arten, the longest version of which was found in the tomb of A at Amarna which is very similar in style and content to Psalm 104. This hymn is said to have been composed by the pharaoh Akhenaten, who is credited with transforming Egyptian religion into a single cult based around the sun disc deity Aten, which is considered by some to be monotheistic. Attempts have occasionally been made to equate Akhenaten with Moses, including Sigmund Freud's book Moses and Monotheism, However, there are no other aspects of this pharaoh's life, or indeed his Artemis cult, that resemble the biblical account of Moses. The similarities with the psalm probably result only from the fact that the two compositions share a common literary heritage. They may even both derive from a common Near Eastern original. The same reason is usually given for the very close parallels that have been observed between a late period wisdom text known as the Instruction of Amenemopet, son of Canaanite, and the biblical book of Proverbs, although it has been suggested by some scholars that the writers of Proverbs may even have been influenced by a text of the Instruction of Amenemopet itself. It is an irony of biblical archaeology that the more we investigate the texts and archaeological remains that link Egypt with the Bible, the less substantial and the less convincing these kinds of connections appear to be. As John Romer observed in Testament, the Bible and History, ultimately, archaeology can neither prove nor disprove the Old Testament, only modern theories about what it might mean. The biblical archaeology of Egypt was perhaps always doomed to be something of a blind alley, but undoubtedly in the early years of Egyptology, both classical and biblical writings played the crucial role of familiar roots into an otherwise alien and largely incomprehensible landscape. As with the question of the date at which European antiquarianism was superseded by archaeology, it's not easy to suggest a specific date when the writings of early travellers and the collecting of Egyptian antiquities became transformed into something approaching the modern discipline of Egyptology. Most histories of Egyptian archaeology, however, see the Napoleonic expedition at the beginning of the 19th century as the first systematic attempt to record and describe the standing remains of pharaonic Egypt. The importance of the description de l'Egypte 
the multi-volume publication that resulted from the expedition, lay not only in its high standards of draftsmanship and accuracy, but also in the fact that it constituted a continuous and internally consistent appraisal by a single group of scholars, thus providing the first real attempt at an assessment of ancient Egypt in its entirety. Despite the scientific aims of Napoleon's savants, virtually all 19th century excavations in Egypt were designed to provide art treasures for European and American museums and private collections, since the expedition's financial support invariably derived from these sources. What's remarkable about the European expeditions to Egypt in the first half of the 19th century is the rapid pace with which new information was acquired, digested, and assimilated into the overall picture of the pharaonic period. In 1838, the French architect Hector Oo published a panorama of Egypt, including an illustration showing the principal monuments of Egypt. The painting took the form of an imaginary view of the meandering course of the River Nile, with Alexandria and the Mediterranean coast in the foreground, and the Temple of Isis on the island of Philae in the far distance. This pictorial view of Egypt, already incorporating the basic essentials of Egyptian architecture, from the pyramids at Giza to the temples of eastern and western Thebes, is a good metaphor for the speed with which the bare bones of Egyptology were assembled. As early as the 1830s, Gardner Wilkinson was able to present a wide-ranging and detailed view of ancient Egypt in his Manners and Customs. Certainly there were inaccuracies, misconceptions and omissions in the publications of the early 19th century, but in many respects the fundamentals were already known and the last one and a half centuries have arguably been more concerned with filling in the details than breaking new ground. Between the period of organized plundering undertaken by such men as Giovanni Bazzoni and Bernardino Dravetti in the early 19th century, and the excavations of Emile and Melino and Jacques de Morgan in the 1890s, there was surprisingly little development in the techniques employed by Egyptian archaeologists. John Wortham neatly encapsulates this phase in his History of British Egyptology. Although archaeologists no longer used dynamite to excavate sites, their techniques remained unrefined. Arguably one of the most insidious and retrogressive aspects of 19th century archaeology in Egypt was the concept of clearance as opposed to scientific excavation. The very word appeared to substantiate the fallacy that the sand simply had to be removed in order to reveal the significant monuments hidden below thus helping to discourage the proper consideration of stratigraphic excavation and the appreciation of all components of a site, sand, potsherds, mud bricks and towering stone gateways, as equally important and integral elements of the archaeological record. Such clearance also frequently involved the destruction of the more recent material, primarily the Byzantine and Islamic phases of site, which generally held little fascination for early scholars compared with the pharaonic antiquities. From the 1880s onwards, however, the emergence of more scientific approaches gradually hauled Egyptology into a more methodical era. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, at a time when scientific methods of field work and analysis were still developing throughout the various branches of archaeology, the innovative methods of two particular Egyptologists, Flinders Petrie and George Reisner, set new standards for the discipline as a whole. This was perhaps the only stage in its history when Egyptian archaeology was at the forefront of the development of methodology, setting the pattern for excavations in Europe and America. In Bruce Trigger's A History of Archaeological Thought, there are a mere handful of references to Egyptian archaeology. Only Flinders Petrie's invention of an early form of seriation known as sequence dating merits a full page or so of discussion. While this may well be a fair assessment of the Egyptological contribution to archaeological thought, the excavation of Egyptian sites has, over the last 150 years, provided a steady stream of valuable data. The rapidly expanding Egyptian database has provided new insights into the material culture of the pharaonic period, but perhaps more importantly, it has also made a significant contribution to the creation of a chronological framework for the Mediterranean region.
The central role played by ancient Egypt in the formulation of ancient chronology has lent greater significance to recent attempts to pinpoint flaws in the chronology of the pharaonic period, but the established chronology is now a dense matrix of archaeological and textual details that have proved difficult to unpick and reassemble. The Nana palette was discovered about a metre away from a buried collection of ceremonial objects dating to the late pre-dynastic and early dynastic periods, circa 3100 to 2700 BC, including further ceremonial palettes, as well as ritual mace heads and carved ivory figurines. This assemblage of artefacts discovered by Quibble and Green, and described by them as the main deposit, has since proved to be one of the most important sets of evidence for our understanding of the beginnings of the Egyptian state. Unfortunately, because of a lack of accurate published plans and stratigraphic sections from the site, the full significance and the true date of this crucial early find remain unclear. In the vicinity, the excavators also discovered several valuable pieces from somewhat later in Egyptian history. These included two unique copper alloy statues of the late Old Kingdom ruler Pepi I, 2321 to 2287 BC, and the golden head of a falcon that is perhaps part of one of the cult statues worshipped in the temple. The mixture of objects of different dates suggests that they comprised a whole series of royal gifts to the temple. However, we have no way of knowing whether each piece was brought to the temple in person by a number of rulers from the late pre-dynastic through to the Old Kingdom, or whether they were all dedicated en masse by a later ruler in the Old or Middle Kingdoms. Some of Quibble's comments on the excavation of the main deposit and the immediately surrounding area convey a rather honest despair that their techniques were not quite equal to the task. Day after day we sat in this hall, scraping away the earth and trying to disentangle the objects from one another, for they lay in every possible position, each piece in contact with five or six others, interlocking as a handful of matches will, when shaken together and thrown down upon a table. In Egypt Before the Pharaohs, the American prehistorian Michael Hoffman summarized just how much of a hash seems to have been made by Quibble and Green, although it would also be a mistake to underestimate the complexity of their task at Hierocompolis. Sadly, we do not even know for sure where the most graphic piece of evidence, the Nama Palace, actually came from. It was evidently found near the main deposit, but not actually with the other material. From Green's field notes, Quibble kept none, it seems to have been found a metre or two away, and Green noted in the 1902 publication that it was found in a place directly associated with an apparently proto-dynastic level, which would date it to a generation or two before the unification of the two lands in 3100 BC. But two years earlier, in the first report published on Hierocompolis by Quibble, it was labelled as coming from the main deposit proper, a feature that may be as late as the Middle Kingdom, circa 2130 to 1785 BC. The particular nature and context of Quibble and Green's discovery of the Nama Palace at Hierocompolis highlight the fact that great finds can, in extreme cases, be rendered almost meaningless if their full context is not properly recorded. Even the most meticulous excavation may sometimes run up against interpretive problems, but conversely, if discoveries are made or published in an unscientific way, then there is only the slimmest chance of their full meaning becoming apparent. This is also true of the overall cultural context of late pre-dynastic ceremonial palettes, like that of Nana. David O'Connor, for instance, has raised the possibility that the images on the two sides of each palette were organised differently because they served distinct ritual functions within their practical religious settings, with the side that incorporated the cosmetic grinding area usually being uppermost and probably therefore more important. He also stresses, however, that the ceremonial palettes need to be seen as only tiny specific components within an overall complex of ritual images, objects and architecture, only scattered fragments of which have survived from the late pre-dynastic and early dynastic periods. Huge amounts of data have survived from ancient Egypt, and Egyptologists have consequently tended to be data-hungry scholars.
A constant succession of fresh discoveries has ensured that the evidence itself has been steadily increasing in quantity and diversity. It's noticeable, however, that archaeological discoveries in Egypt have become such a cliché in the way that the media respond to them and portray the discoveries and the protagonists that an issue of Punch in 1986 was able to satirise very effectively the breathless and overblown way in which a new find, in this case the tomb of a man called Mayer, Tutankhamun's treasurer, was pumped up into a ninny Tutankhamun's tomb. The subject itself has not progressed purely through discoveries of new data. New paradigms have been adopted by different generations of Egyptologists, gradually transforming the accepted picture of ancient Egyptian culture. Secondly, new methods, such as innovative excavation techniques or sophisticated processes of scientific analysis, have, at various times, altered our perceptions of the surviving evidence from ancient Egypt. Whatever the hyperbole of the media, some of the archaeological discoveries have genuinely represented significant turning points in the history of the subject, as in the case of the excavation of Aegean-style frescoes at the site of Tel el-Daba in 1987, or the unearthing of a rich cache of clay tablets inscribed in cuneiform script as Amana, the so-called Amana letters, in the 1890s, like the Nana palette, both of these finds were quickly recognized not merely as crucial new pieces in the Egyptological jigsaw, but as genuinely revolutionary types of information, necessitating significant rearrangement of the existing pattern of pieces. The Austrian Archaeological Institute, Cairo, has been excavating since the 1960s at Tel El Dava, the site of the city of Avaris, capital of the Hyksos rulers from Syria, Palestine, who gained control of northern Egypt during the so-called Second Intermediate Period. The deep stratigraphy at Tel El Dava allows the changing settlement patterns of a large Bronze Age community to be observed over a period of many generations. In the late 1980s, the main focus of excavation was the substructure of a large palace building of the early 18th dynasty, circa 1550 BC, at Esber Helmi, on the western edge of the site. In 1987, many fragments of Minoan wall paintings were discovered among debris covering the ancient gardens adjoining the palace. Several of these derived from compositions evidently depicting bull leapers, like those in the famous Middle Bronze Age palace at Nosas. Whereas the Minoan and Mycenaean pottery vessels previously found at many New Kingdom sites in Egypt are usually interpreted as evidence of trade with the Aegean, the presence of Minoan wall paintings at Tel El Daba hinted that the population of Avaris in the early 18th dynasty may actually have included Aegean families. It's been suggested that the frequent use of a red painted background may even mean that the Avaris Minoan paintings predate those of Crete and Thera, Santorini. The existence of Minoan wall paintings at a site within Egypt may help to explain the appearance in the early 18th dynasty Egyptian tomb paintings of such Aegean motives as the flying gut, that is, the depiction of animals' fore and hind legs outstretched in full flight. Were the Avaris paintings created by Minoan artists, or had Egyptian artists perhaps been trained by Minoans? Similar fragments of Minoan paintings have been found at three sites in the Levant, Tel Kabri, Kadna, and Aaka, where they also appear to be associated with the ruling elite, as at Avaris. This discovery is one of a small number of crucial linchpins that are potentially able to link together the chronologies of various cultures across the East Mediterranean region. The find also raises the question of what we mean by Minoan culture. Until the discovery of the Avaris frescoes, it was assumed that Crete was the source of this kind of Minoan art, and that when it appeared elsewhere, it was a sign of Cretan contact with other cultures in the Mediterranean, either through trade or population movement. The presence of Minoan art in the Egyptian delta, perhaps before it had appeared on Crete, suggests that it might have actually originated outside Crete, Although the fact that this is so far the only recorded instance of this kind of art in Egypt probably makes it unlikely that Egyptian culture itself was the source. Like the Avaris frescoes, the Amarna letters were a non-Egyptian find from within an Egyptian archaeological context. <laughs>
They're also similar in their far-reaching implications, since the Amana letters have come to exert a significant influence on our understanding of the politics and history of Egypt and the Near East in the Late Bronze Age. The story of the Amana letters began in 1887, when a number of small clay tablets inscribed with the cuneiform script of Mesopotamia and the Levant were discovered by a village woman digging ancient mud brick for use as fertilizer, Samak in Arabic. This discovery led to further illicit diggings and the appearance of a number of clay tablets on the antiquities market. Their importance was not immediately recognized and many passed into private hands, but Wallace Budge of the British Museum believed the tablets to be genuine and purchased a number of them. It was Archibald Sace, professor of Assyriology at Oxford University at that time, who summed up their significance. A single archaeological discovery has upset mountains of learned discussion, of ingenious theory and sceptical demonstration. The subsequent excavations of Flinders Petrie at Amarna in 1891-2 revealed a few more tablets, thus confirming that the fine spot of the bulk of the tablet was in the centre of the ancient city of Arkatatan, almost certainly from beneath the floor of a building identified by stamped mud bricks as place of the letters of Pharaoh, as well as nearby structures. Several further tablets were found by German and British excavators at Amarna in the first few decades of the 20th century, bringing the total to 382. These are now spread mainly between the collections of the British Museum, the Louvre, the Vorder Asiatisches Museum in Berlin, and the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, although a few can also be found in other museums in Europe and the USA. Most of the finds came from the initial illicit digging at Amarna rather than from scientific excavations, making the precise origins of over 90% of the tablets uncertain. Their exact chronology is also still debated, but they span a 15 to 30 year period, beginning around year 30 of Amenhotep III, 1391 to 1353, and extending no later than the first year of Tutankhamun's reign, 1333 to 1323 with the majority dating to the reign of Akhenaten, 1353 to 1335. Most are inscribed with texts in a dialect of the Akkadian language, which was the lingua franca of the time, although the languages of the Assyrians, Hittites and Hurrians, Mitanni, are also represented. The majority of the documents in the archive are items of diplomatic correspondence between Egypt and either the great powers in Western Asia, such as Babylonia and Assyria, or the vassal states of Syria and Palestine. They provide a fascinating picture of the relationships between Egypt and these states, although there are very few letters from the Egyptian rulers, the vast majority being the letters sent to them by other rulers. One interpretation of the letters is that they document the disintegration of the Egyptian Empire during the reign of Akhenaten, the so-called heretic pharaoh, who left few records of military campaigns and is therefore assumed to have neglected foreign policy in favour of a programme of religious and political reforms within Egypt itself. An alternative view would be that we happen by chance to have these documents from Akhenaten's reign, and that similar archives from earlier or later in the New Kingdom, had they survived, might contain equally desperate pleas for assistance from Syro-Palestinian cities under siege. In other words, it might be argued that our view of Egyptian influence over Syria-Palestine is largely based on the Egyptians' own accounts of their battles and victories, and that the chaotic state of affairs documented in the Amarna letters might actually have been the normal condition of the Egyptian empire throughout the New Kingdom, rather than being a temporary aberration. Another controversy that has emerged out of the translation and interpretation of the Amarna letters is the question of who the Apiru are. Many of the tablets from syro palestinian vassals refer to a group of people called the Apiru, who appear to have been widespread across the Near East throughout the second millennium BC. Since the first translations of the letters spelt the name Hapiru or Habiru, biblical scholars immediately began to explore the possibility that these were the first references to Hebrews, some even specifically correlating references to Apiru attacks with the account of Joshua's invasion of Canaan. 
However, there's not yet been any conclusive proof that the ethnic terms Apiru and Ibri Hebrew are linked etymologically, and it is not even clear whether Apiru refers to an ethnic group, a social group, or an economic class, or all three, with one commentator suggesting that the term was synonymous with social banditry. As John Laughlin points out, it is certainly true to say that not all Apiru were Hebrews. Whether any Hebrews were ever a Piru is, at the moment, an open question. As well as giving insights into the political conditions of the time, the letters also shed light on trade relations and the values of particular commodities, such as glass, gold, and the newly introduced iron, while the various forms of address employed in the letters indicate the standing of the writers vis-à-vis -vis the Egyptian court. They have been used to study such issues as international law in the Amarna age, diplomatic signalling, and socio-psychological analysis of late Bronze Age diplomats and rulers. Apart from this fresh textual scrutiny, the Amarna tablets have also been subjected to petrographic analysis to examine the actual clays from which they were formed and compare them with the geology of various sites in the Mediterranean, the Near East and North Africa in order to try to work out the places from which the letters were sent. Using this method, Dr. Yuval Gorin, an Israeli geologist, tackled the question of the whereabouts of the ancient kingdom of Alashihir, which was associated with the supply of copper to Egypt and other countries, and which might have been located in Cyprus, Cilicia, northwest Syria, or even southern Israel. The fabric of one of eight Alashihir letters in the British Museum looked quite different, suggesting that, unlike most of the tablets, it might not be an Egyptian-made local copy, but might possibly be one of the original letters made from clay at Alashihir itself. It was made from a pinkish marley clay that includes many fragments of chloride and dolerite, suggesting that the clay was obtained from a particular type of area dominated by igneous rock. Goran found that this helped to narrow down the likely choices to the Trudos Massif from Cyprus, the region of Kitsuwatna in Anatolia, and the Birbashin region of northwest Syria. He was then able to rule out first Kitsuwatna, because it was governed by Egypt's great rivals, the Hittites, and secondly the northwest Syrian area, because it seemed to be too geologically diverse to fit the bill. On Cyprus, on the other hand, there was one region that fitted the evidence in various ways. Geologically, the likely area was located between the Doneritic Trudos Mountains and adjacent Marni part of the island, which would have provided a pink clay with a mixture of dolerite and Marni clay just like that of the tablet. Significantly, this area of Cyprus is also the area in which copper was being produced from the Middle Bronze Age onwards. Cyprus itself had always been the favourite candidate for the location of Lashihir, but Gorin's analysis seems to provide good scientific support for the theory. Although most of the Amarna archive consists of letters, it also includes 32 other kinds of texts that do not seem to have been directly connected with international diplomacy. These tablets were probably related to scribal education and the process of translation itself, including a dictionary-like list of Akkadian and Egyptian words, a fragment of a syllabary, as well as several scribal exercises and literary texts. We therefore not only have the royal correspondence itself, but also some of the evidence for the activities of the scribes employed to write and translate the letters. A steadily adjusted and reframed picture of Egyptian civilization has periodically allowed earlier finds to be reviewed and reinterpreted, sometimes quite radically. Although the circumstances of the discovery of the Tel el Daba frescoes and the Amarna letters were quite different and separated in date by around a century, both were nevertheless fairly rapidly recognized as important finds. There are, however, many instances of important finds that were at first totally misinterpreted or regarded as unremarkable, and only came to be recognized as really significant sources of evidence long after the discovery had been made. One very good example of a great discovery that was initially completely misunderstood comes, surprisingly, from the career of the great Flinders Petrie. 
In his excavation of the Makada cemeteries in 1895, he found that virtually all of the graves comprised rectangular, sometimes brick wine, pits, containing one or more bodies in fetal positions, placed on reed mats, with the head oriented towards the west. Occasionally the bodies appeared to have been deliberately dismembered before burial, and there were some indications of human sacrifice. The varying quantities of grave goods usually consisted of some combination of pottery, stone vessels, grey wacker pallets, flint knives, beads, bracelets and figurines. Petri immediately recognised that these were quite different from conventional Egyptian burials. However, his conclusion that they belonged to a new race from outside Egypt, who had supposedly invaded Egypt at the end of the Old Kingdom, was to turn out to be drastically wrong, both chronologically and ethnically. The most galling aspect of getting this wrong from Petri's point of view was the fact that one of his great rivals, Jean de Morgan, came up with the correct solution when he published a similar set of graves at Abydos. The people buried in the Nakada and Abydos cemeteries were different, not because they were a new race, but because they were the Egyptians of late prehistory, whose long sequence of culture preceded the pharaonic period and had until then been virtually unknown. As if to make amends for his colossal error, Petri went on to use the Nakada material to develop the ingenious sequence dating system, forming the basis for the first pre-dynastic chronology, which many would rate among his greatest achievements. Conversely, some of the most famous finds made in Egypt have not necessarily had very significant effects on our views of Egypt. Howard Carter's discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun, for instance, obviously had enormous impact on the public awareness of ancient Egypt from the 1920s onwards, but, apart from providing the first tantalising glimpse of the sumptuous range of equipment which must once have been contained in the tombs of much more renowned and long-lived pharaohs, such as Amenhotep III and Ramesses the Great, it contributed very little genuinely new historical data. Arguably, Carter's greatest achievement was to raise the public profile of Egyptian archaeology to a much higher level, but the contents of the tomb have not yet taken the subject in any new directions or changed opinions on any great historical debates. The tomb is, of course, arguably the most exciting find in the history of archaeology, and its contents have increasingly yielded information on various aspects of the technology of the 14th century BC, but Egyptologists can be very difficult to please. As a result of the increasing application of innovative methods of survey, excavation and analysis, the professional archaeologist has begun to require at least a nodding acquaintance with a number of scientific disciplines, such as bioanthropology, geology, genetics and physics. This process of expansion of Egyptology has added strength to the subject, with each of these different academic disciplines providing fresh sources of stimulation and new directions for future research. In Carter's time, science was only just beginning to have an effect on the world of Egyptology, primarily in the form of a man called Alfred Lucas, who, within four years of the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb, was to publish the first edition of Ancient Egyptian Materials and Industries, a brilliant summary of the surviving evidence for Egyptian materials and craftwork, which served as the essential manual for Egyptological science until the 1990s. Lucas was a chemist working in Cairo, who had access to much of the material in the Egyptian museum, enabling him to publish data, chemical analyses and bibliographical references for a great deal of the most important material excavated since the mid-19th century, including the objects from the tomb of Tutankhamun. There are two aspects of the study of ancient Egypt that have been repeatedly affected by science over the last 50 years. First, the use of science has meant that some elements of the archaeological record that were previously regarded as relatively uninformative, such as soil and seeds, have begun to produce as much information as more traditional finds, such as sculptures and papyri. Second, the application of scientific techniques has allowed more information to be squeezed out of conventional types of evidence. Nonified bodies, instead of simply being unwrapped and examined externally, can now be x-rayed and CT scanned in various ways, and DNA samples can reveal a great deal more about the nature and identity of the specific human or animal concerned. 
Artifacts can be studied not only in terms of their shape, size and decoration, but also with regard to the type of material from which they were made, where it came from, how it was extracted, and what techniques were used to transform it into a prestige funerary item. Indeed, the whole question of the procurement and working of materials has become a much more frequently researched aspect of ancient Egypt over the last two decades or so. What can geology and archaeology tell us about the origins of the Nama Palette? The Nama Palette was carved from a type of rock geologically known as grey wacker, but often mistakenly described as schist or slate, which was used for a variety of artefacts in the pre-dynastic period. By early dynastic times, this versatile material was even being used for sculpture, including a seated statue of the second dynasty ruler Kasakenwi, which was found near the Nama Palette at Hierakonpolis and is now in the Egyptian Museum Cairo. The only good quality source of ancient Egyptian greatwaka is located in the Wadi Hamamat, in the centre of the eastern desert, midway between the Nile city of Kuf and the Red Sea port of Kusair. The quarries were worked for thousands of years, from the pre-dynastic period through to Roman times, circa 4000 BC to AD 500. Hundreds of rock-cut inscriptions and numerous quarry workings are spread along this 16-kilometre stretch of the wadi, west of the confluence with Wadi Atona. The site has been studied by many archaeologists and Egyptologists over the last century, but most have tended to focus on the inscriptions rather than the archaeological remains or the rock art. A huge Roman period quarrier's ramp runs up the south side of the wadi, while on the floor of the wadi on the north side are the ruins of a small area of settlement that so far seems to date no earlier than the mid-first millennium BC. The current geo-archaeological expedition working at the site, led by Dr. Elizabeth Bloxham, not only chooses to focus much more on the archaeology of all periods at the site, but also takes a pioneering holistic approach to the Wadi Hamamat as a whole, allowing the textual sources and the archaeological material to be studied contextually in their full range of spatial and chronological relationships with one another. Throughout the pharaonic period, the grey wacker quarries were exploited for large objects such as sarcophagi, naoi, and sculptures. But there was an important much earlier phase of exploitation, from at least the 4th millennium BC onwards, when the stone was used to produce smaller artefacts, particularly beads, bracelets, vessels, and ritual cosmetic palettes, including, of course, the Nama palette itself. The earliest period of quarrying at the site had not previously been studied, apart from a small amount of survey and excavation conducted in 1949 by the prehistorian Fernand de Bono. His pioneering survey of the Egyptian eastern desert included study of a number of pre-dynastic burials and settlements sporadically spaced along the 150-kilometer stretch of the Wadi Hamanat, but this work was only partially published. In 2010, Bloxham's team decided to seek out the pre-dynastic and early dynastic quarries and the workshops associated with them. The one clue they had initially was a photograph that de Bono had taken showing an early workshop and settlement that he had excavated in the Bir Hamanat region. The location of the photograph was extremely difficult to identify until they chanced on a rock-carved graffito left by de Bono himself, which then allowed them to identify the workshop on a gravelly terrace just yards away. Subsequently, they found a smaller but better preserved workshop, also on a slightly elevated area at the edge of the wadi, where both bracelets and pallets were being manufactured, with several fragments of pottery dating the activities to the mid to late pre-dynastic period, circa 3500 to 3000 BC. They found several discs of grey wacker partially worked into bracelets, as well as two pallet roughouts, and it was clear that a range of tools were being used to produce finished items in the workshops. Chert bladelets and crescent drills, as well as silicified sandstone borers and grinders, were among a suite of largely imported specialist stone tools used by the craftspeople. These tools, whether imported as raw materials or already fashioned into toolkits, can only have been brought into the workshops by people arriving from elsewhere, given that shirt and silicified sandstone deposits of such quality are not local to the site. 
This fresh evidence has provided intriguing insights into the extent of specialist local and regional craft nobility during the pre-dynastic. De Bono, however, had not located any of the early quarries supplying the workshops. Where were they? As Boxham and her team conducted their survey of the quarrying region, they discovered one useful practical thing. If you want to move rapidly around the Hananat landscape, you need to get up onto the mountains and ridges adjoining the main body, rather than trudging through endless smaller wadis where progress is slow, visibility of the surrounding area is poor, and it's very easy to get lost, even when only a hundred yards or so off the beaten track. The team therefore followed a hunch that the earliest quarriers might have had the same kind of mobility issues, leading them to site their quarries up in the hills overlooking the main wadi, where they could be accessed without descending to the main wadi floor. Eventually, the team found the first of numerous small quarries high above the wadi, where rough outs for pallets, vessels and bracelets clearly indicated that Greywacker was being hacked out of the mountainside for these pre-dynastic and early dynastic artefacts. The early quarries typically took the form of platforms carved out of the steep mountain slope, creating a narrow terrace no more than 30 metres in length, and therefore probably only able to accommodate groups of up to 10 workers at any one time. The quarries were interconnected by numerous heavily worn mountain paths, mostly still clearly visible even after the passage of thousands of years, suggesting frequent movement of quarriers and craftsmen across the highland landscape. It was noticeable that panels of rock art often seemed to be located at the entrances to subsidiary quarries leading up to these higher places, as if acting as signposts. Bloxham knew, from the comparative archaeology of quarries many thousands of miles away, such as the Neolithic greenstone quarries in the English Lake District and the Mount William Aboriginal stone axe quarries in Australia, that choices made by ancient quarriers could often have as much to do with issues relating to ritual, landscape and social interconnections as with purely geological or logistical factors. As she puts it, we cannot discard the numerous cross-cultural examples in which rock art and quarry in a link together, typically as a nexus between people, marking a symbolic, even spiritual connection with places to which individuals and groups frequently return. She stresses the likelihood that the early quarry workers, one of whom would have skillfully roughed out the basic shield shape of the Nama Palad on one of these precipitous terraces high above the main Wadi Hananat, were probably local kin groups made up of specialists, extracting and shaping the rock with pounders, axes and chisels, fashioned both from the local grey wagger itself and from non-local types of flint and silicified sandstone. Ironically, it seems that the origins of the Nama palette lay far from the Nile Valley itself, in the hands of workers, perhaps Benouin, who might not even have identified as ancient Egyptians themselves. One of the fundamental questions often asked about the Nana Palace is whether, as its discoverers assumed, it was created as a record of a specific historical event, the military triumph on which the first unified kingdom of Upper and Lower Egypt was founded. The palace and various other proto-dynastic artefacts have long been regarded as lying at the interface of prehistory and history in ancient Egypt. The term proto-dynastic was invented to describe the crucial period, encompassing the late pre-dynastic and the beginning of the early dynastic period. The pre-dynastic was the last few hundred years of the long prehistoric period in the Nile Valley, while early dynastic refers to the first few centuries of the dynastic or pharaonic period. At the time of the discovery of the Nama Palace, the pre-dynastic period was barely known at all, since it was not until the following year that Flinders Petrie published the first chronological framework for late prehistory, using sequence dates based on changing fashions of artefacts in grave goods at the pre-dynastic Nakano cemeteries. This means that the chronological context of the palace would have been seen quite differently by Quibble and Green compared with modern researchers. Whereas most Egyptologists now see this crucial artifact as part of the culmination of a long period of late pre-dynastic cultural development, including a developing corpus of decorated palettes, its discoverers regarded it as the first real document in recorded history, emerging almost magically out of what seemed then to be the darkness of prehistory. <laughs>
The palette immediately began to be interpreted as a record of the first truly significant historical event in Egyptian history, the military defeat of Lower Egypt, the Delta region in the north, by the ruler of an expanding Upper Egyptian kingdom. When the British Egyptologist Brian Emery made the first real attempt to summarize the nature of early dynastic Egypt with the publication of Archaic Egypt in 1961, a great deal of the primary evidence was freshly excavated, much of it by himself and his contemporaries or immediate predecessors. There was also, of course, a large quantity of evidence that had not yet been excavated, particularly with regard to the thousands of years preceding the emergence of the early Egyptian state. When Emery was writing, Egyptian prehistory, like many other aspects of the modern discipline, was still very much in its infancy. So it's not surprising to find that he constantly looks forwards in the pharaonic period for comparisons and analogies that can anchor his subject as a specific stage of the Egyptians' cultural development. In contrast, recent books and articles on early dynastic Egypt tend to be more firmly rooted in the late pre-dynastic. Indeed, the fresh excavation of early cemeteries that abide us in the last two decades of the 20th century provided new evidence for the existence of a politically and or culturally united Egypt well before the First Dynasty. Work in the late pre-dynastic cemetery year at Abydos, comprising elite tombs dating earlier than the time of King Nama, demonstrated that certain elements of Egyptian kingship, including a model royal scepter carved from ivory, stretched back at least 150 years earlier than the beginning of the first dynasty. Many modern Egyptologists have applied explicitly anthropological approaches to the study of the formation of the state in early complex societies, but for Emory's generation of archaeologists, the culture history approach was still the main paradigm in archaeology. In the first half of the 20th century, most archaeologists thought that cultural change happened primarily because of the diffusion of either people or ideas between cultural or ethnic groups. Thus, the prehistoric development of Egypt tended to be explained in terms of mass migrations. Emery was keen to promote the idea that the emergence of Egyptian civilization at the end of the fourth millennium was the result of the invasion or emigration of the so-called dynastic race, or followers of Horus, from Mesopotamia. Now, however, the mess of advances in our knowledge of prehistory and recent excavations of pre-dynastic and early dynastic sites, particularly the early royal necropolis at Abydos and the city and cemetery at Hierakonpolis, have demonstrated extremely convincingly that the development and inauguration of the pharaonic age was largely an indigenous Egyptian phenomenon arising steadily and almost inevitably out of processes of the late pre-dynastic social, economic and political change within the Nile Valley. From the Paleolithic period onwards, people in Egypt were using flat pieces of stone as pallets on which to grind mineral-based pigments such as ochre and malachite. Initially, they were simple slabs made from a variety of different stone types, but from the early pre-dynastic period, circa 4,500 to 4,000 BC onwards, they were made largely of grey worker, quarried from the Wadi Hamanat, as discussed at the end of chapter 2. It was also in the early pre-dynastic that people began to fashion the palettes into distinctive shapes, initially long oval forms with a notch at each end, often placing them in graves as part of the funerary equipment, sometimes accompanied by red or brown jasper pebbles that were probably used for grinding. In 2013, two diorite pallets stained with malachite and ochre were excavated from tomb 72 in the pre-dynastic cemetery HK6 at Hierakonpolis, which is an unusual and highly elaborate elite burial dating to circa 3700 to 3600 BC. In this instance, the pallets were accompanied not only by pebbles, but also by a unique find of three tips of ivory tusks used as containers for yellow ochre. It's unclear whether the pigments ground on the pre-dynastic pallets were used for production of paints and dyes decorating such things as pottery vessels and early textiles, or whether they were primarily used for cosmetics, such as eye paint. <laughs> 
Evidence for use of cosmetics at this date includes a terracotta figurine from a grave at Mahasna dating to Nakada I, circa 3800 to 3600 BC, which seems to have its eyes outlined in green, while traces of malachite have been found on naturally mummified individuals excavated from the pre-dynastic cemetery at Edema. Pre-dynastic palettes were fashioned into a wide variety of shapes which changed over time from the oval Badarian palette through to predominantly rhomboidal ones in the Nakada I period, occasionally with small motifs such as bird shapes sculpted at one end and animal, fish and bird forms in Nakada II, circa 3600 to 3350 BC. Interestingly, these zoomorphic themes are mirrored in the shapes of other objects placed in graves at this time, such as stone vessels and bone and ivory cones. In the Carta III, circa 3350 to 3000 BC, the final phase of the pre-dynastic period, there was a return to more geometric forms, particularly simple rectangles. The surfaces of some of these later palettes are sculpted with images of various types. A palette from a grave at Alhambra, British Museum 35501, for example, is carved with a combination of two early hieroglyphs, a sign comprising oppositely facing arrowheads superimposed over another representing a crook or staff, usually interpreted as the symbol representing the god Nin. These relatively simple decorated palettes can perhaps be seen as earlier prototypes of the larger, more ceremonial palettes exemplified by that of Nana. The ceremonial palettes, which began to appear in the Nakata III period, tend to be primarily associated with temple contexts rather than tombs. More than 25 of them have so far been found, and their decoration is more closely associated with that of ceremonial mace heads and ivory knife handles than with the funerary palettes. Several significant votive palettes and mace heads were found by Quibble and Green at Hierocombolus including limestone fragments from a large pear-shaped mace head that, like the Nana palace, bears early hieroglyphic signs spelling out the name Nana. This Nana mace head appears to show not warlike scenes, but ones that are more obviously to do with early rituals associated with kinship, one of which is regarded by some researchers as the first known version of the ritual known as the appearance of the king of Lower Egypt. Fragments were also found of another limestone mace head, now in the Ashmolean Museum, Oxford, also decorated with raised relief scenes, including a man wearing the upper Egyptian white crown. This individual is the largest figure on the mace head, and an accompanying ideogram appears to identify him as King Scorpion, who may have been Nama's predecessor on the throne. The figure of Scorpion is grasping a large hoe, while a servant holds out to him a basket, perhaps in order to catch the earth that he is removing from the ground. The fact that he and his servant are standing immediately beside some kind of watercourse has led to suggestions that he is ritually excavating an irrigation canal with the help of attendants. As a result of this interpretation, which is widely held but not necessarily conclusively proven, the scorpion mace head has frequently been used as a crucial piece of evidence in the hypothesis that the Egyptian state and its characteristic monarchical style of government emerged through the control of water by an elite group. The Canadian Egyptologist Nick Millet argued that the images and texts on the ceremonial palettes and mace heads of the late 4th and early 3rd millennia were not intended to describe historical events in themselves, but simply to commemorate and date particular points in time. He suggested that the scenes on the Nana mace head resemble the brief lists of rituals given for each year of a series of early kings' reigns on the Palermo Stone part of a large 5th dynasty basalt steel recording the reigns of several early Egyptian rulers which is discussed in more detail in the section on chronologies. Our analysis of the scenes and texts on objects such as the Nana Palace and Mace Head is generally complicated by the modern urge to be able to distinguish between real events and rituals. But the ancient Egyptians show very little inclination to distinguish consistently between the two, and indeed, it might be argued that Egyptian ideology during the Pharaonic period, particularly insofar as it related to the kingship, was reliant on the maintenance of some degree of confusion between real happenings and purely ritual or magical acts.
The texts and artifacts that form the basis of Egyptian history usually convey information which is either general, mythological or ritualistic, or particular, historical. And usually, our aim in constructing Egyptian historical narrative is to distinguish as clearly as possible between these types of information, taking into account the ancient Egyptians' tendency to blur the boundaries between the two. This debate concerning rituals, symbols and historical events was given an intriguing new twist in the late 1990s, when a German excavation team re-examined the early royal burials at Abydos. In tomb B-16, they found an almost complete ivory label, decorated with images closely resembling some of those on the Nama pad. Like most other surviving examples of this kind of label, found both in the early dynastic royal tombs and the late pre-dynastic elite burials of Cemetery U, it was made in order to identify the quality, quantity and year of delivery of a product, usually a vessel containing imported oil, placed in the tomb. A small hole bored in the top right-hand corner was intended to attach it to the vessel, and the lower of two lines of incised hieroglyphic inscription identified it as 300 units of first quality oil. It is the upper line of inscription on the Nama label that is the most relevant to our discussion, however, since it closely resembles the smiting scene on the Nama palette, except that in this instance the image is transformed into a form of hieroglyphic sentence comprising the name Nama, which appears twice, once on the right side in a seric frame, as on the palette, and once in the middle of the inscription, but this time with two arms having been added to the Na hieroglyph, the catfish sign, so that it can wield a mace with one hand and grasp a bearded foreigner with the other. The foreigner sprouts plants from his head, like the schematic man held prisoner by the Horus falcon on the palette, and has a small bowl hieroglyph to his left. At the top left, a vulture hovers over a rectangle, perhaps representing the royal palace, with a falcon-topped standard in front of it. This is very plausibly interpreted as the sentence, smiting the Libyan marshland people by Horus Nana, celebration of victory of the palace. Since it presumably identifies the specific year in the king's reign, as the other labels do, it seems likely that it identifies the same year as the scenes depicted on the Nana palette. In addition, a tiny ivory cylinder bearing the name of Nama was found at Hierakonpolis and probably also belongs to the same year in his reign, since it shows the catfish smiting three rows of foreign captives identified with the same word, Chehenra, usually translated as Libyans. Taken together, the label, the cylinder and the palette seem to confirm Millet's idea that the labels and the votive items are all decorated with information describing a particular year in a king's reign. The excavator of the label, German Egyptologist Gunther Dreyer, argued that this combination of evidence proved that Nana's defeat of the Northerners or Libyans was an actual historical event. This assessment, however, seems rather premature. An alternative assumption would be that we simply now have three records of the same event, but we are no closer to knowing whether it was a genuine historical military victory, purely a kingship ritual with no basis in reality, or perhaps even a ceremonial reenactment of some actual earlier triumph. Historians of ancient Egypt sometimes attempt to interpret the Egyptian sources with modern concepts and categories that would have had no real meaning or relevance to the ancient writers. The types of ancient Egyptian texts that are usually described as historical invariably had a very different function when they were originally composed. They therefore have to be carefully interpreted if genuinely historical data are to be extracted from them. The vast majority of alleged historical texts written by the Egyptians were primarily concerned with preserving and transmitting national traditions or with fulfilling a particular religious or funerary role rather than being attempts to present objective accounts of the past. The ancient Egyptians' own presentations of their past might be regarded as celebrations of both continuity and change. Even the Egyptian royal narratives, such as the two stele of Kamosa, circa 1555-1550, describing his battles against the Hyksos in the 17th dynasty, and the annals of Thutmose of the Third, circa 1479-1425, outlining his campaigns in Syria-Palestine in the 18th dynasty, 
are effectively components of the temples in which they were found. Therefore, they differ considerably from the true historical tradition usually said to have been inaugurated by the Greek historian Herodotus, in that they incorporate a high degree of symbolism and pure ritual. The contents of the monumental texts and reliefs on the walls of Egyptian tombs and temples are often much more related to the symbolic and static world of myth than to history. There is a common tendency to regard myth as a form of primitive history, but this is rarely the case. Donald Redford makes a good distinction between Egyptian myth and history. Their meaning, that is, the meaning of myths, has nothing to do with their having occurred in the past, but rather with their present significance. Horus's championing of his father, the upliftings of Shu, the murder of Osiris, these are all primordial events timeless and ever-present, and neither kin nor priest who reenacts them can be said to fulfill an historical role or to be commemorating history. Without some form of chronological framework, history is nothing but an unstructured mass of data. There are numerous ways in which Egyptologists have set about creating such a framework for ancient Egypt, using a complex mixture of archaeological data, such as coffins bearing different types of decoration, texts such as annals and king lists, ancient astronomical observations and scientific dating methods such as radiocarbon dating and, much more rarely, thermoluminescence. Egyptologists use the term royal annals to describe a number of ancient Egyptian texts that either list the names and titles of a sequence of rulers, often called king lists, or present information about events that took place in specific reigns and even individual years within reigns. Virtually all of the surviving examples derive from religious or funerary contexts, and many, particularly the simple lists of names and titles, relate to the celebration of the cult of royal ancestors, whereby each king established his own legitimacy and place in the succession by making regular offerings to a list of the names of his predecessors. The annals have survived in various forms, mostly dating to the New Kingdom, but the earliest is the so-called Palermo Stone, a large fragment of a basalt steel in the Palermo Archaeological Museum, Sicily, which dates to the 5th dynasty, circa 2494 to 2345. The Palermo Stone is inscribed on both sides with hieroglyphic texts describing the reigns of the kings of the first five dynasties, as well as the preceding area of mythological rulers. The size of the original complete steel is estimated to have been about 2.1 metres wide by 0.6 metres high, and six smaller fragments of it have also survived, five in the Egyptian Museum Cairo and one in the Petri Museum, University College London. The seven fragments mostly feature first and fourth dynasty rulers. We have no information about the steel's original find spot, since the main fragment appeared on the antiquities market in 1866, but without provenance. The text begins with many thousands of years taken up by mythological upper and lower Egyptian pre-dynastic rulers, up to the time of the god Horus, who is then said to have given the throne to Nines, generally regarded by ancient Egyptians as the first human ruler of the pharaonic period. The complete steel originally listed Nini's successors up to the early 5th dynasty. The text is divided into a series of horizontal registers, split up by vertical lines, incurved at the top, to represent the hieroglyph for regnal year, Rendat. Each compartment incorporated a brief list of memorable events for that year, as well as a record of the height of the annual Nile inundation. The events recorded were mostly religious festivals, wars, and the creation of particular statues. They therefore actually tell us less about history and more about the early royal court and the emergence of the idea of divine kingship. The name of the ruler concerned is written above the relevant block of compartments. It's frustrating to know that a record detailing every ruler up until the end of Dynasty V, along with the lengths of their reigns, once existed, but that only fragments of it are now within our grasp. A similar old kingdom set of annals, known as the South Saqqara Stone, was found in the 1930s, having been recycled as the sarcophagus lid of Ankesin Pepe, one of the queens at this date. The text of the South Saqqara stone, listing events in the reigns of several 6th dynasty rulers, was probably inscribed in the reign of Pepi II, 
but the signs had mostly been erased through the reuse of the slough. Another tantalizing surviving fragment is the Mitrohina Daybook, originally an old kingdom relief block that was inscribed centuries later with the earliest known example of Middle Kingdom royal annals. This section of annals, describing parts of two years in the reign of the 12th dynasty pharaoh Amenemhat II, was itself later reused as part of the western gateway of the New Kingdom Temple of Tur, near the modern village of Mitrahina, which occupies part of the site of the ancient capital city of Memphis. Unlike the Palermo Stone and South Saqqara Stone, both of which primarily summarize ritual events for each year of the various king's reigns, the Mitrahina inscription provides quite detailed information, including brief reports of military campaigns and trading expeditions. There are, in addition, several monumental king lists from various religious and funerary contexts, each consisting of a simple list of rulers, and all compiled in the New Kingdom. Two were carved into walls at the Abydos temples of Seti I and Ramesses II respectively, the former still in situ and the latter in the British Museum, and another was carved in Karnak temple during the reign of Thutnos III, now in the Louvre. Several other king lists decorated tomb walls, including two lists of 4th and 5th dynasty kings in early 5th dynasty Mastaba tombs at Giza, the so-called Saqqara tablet, now in the Egyptian Museum Cairo, which derives from the tomb of Thunaroy, a high official of Ramesses II, and a scene in the tomb of an 18th dynasty priest called Amenes at Thebes, tomb 373, circa 1300 BC, showing the deceased venerating the statues of 13 previous rulers. Only one example of this kinless genre was written onto papyrus in the Heratic script, and therefore arguably archival rather than ceremonial in nature. This was the Turin papyrus, also known as the Turin royal canon. Like two of the stone-cut hieroglyphic examples, it dates to the reign of Ramesses II. The text not only lists a long sequence of rulers, but also gives the precise duration of each reign, and occasionally provides a summary of the number of years that had elapsed since the time of Ninis. In 1820, this papyrus was purchased in Luxor by the Italian diplomat and antiquities collector Bernardino Drovetti, and is now in the Museo Egizio Turin. At the time that it was acquired by Drovetti, it was evidently still almost complete, but it suffered badly before entering the Turin collection and is now highly fragmentary. Over the last two centuries, the work of various Egyptologists, from Jean-François Champollion through to Jeremy Malek and Kim Royald, led to the numerous fragments of the Turin canon being placed in the correct order, although many lacunae still remain. Originally, it must have contained around 300 names, even including the Asiatic Hyksos rulers of the Second Intermediate Period, although with a sign to indicate that they were foreigners and no royal cartouche shape around the names, and ending with Ramesses II. Like the Palermo Stone, the list attempted to go back beyond the reigns of known things and to assign reign lengths to the unnamed spirits and gods who had supposedly ruled before the coming of the first pharaoh. There are also a few much briefer king lists in a variety of contexts and media, such as a rock-cut graffito at the quarrying site of Wadi Hananat, dated paleographically to the 12th dynasty, 1991-1783, which consists of the names of five 4th dynasty rulers and princes. Two early dynastic seal impressions were discovered by German archaeologists in tombs Q and T at Abydos in the 1985 and 1995 excavations respectively. They were carved with short sequences of first dynasty rulers' names, one of them listing six rulers in the following order, Nana, Ah, Jer, Jet, Den, and Mernith thus providing another crucial piece of evidence that the king depicted on the Nana palette was probably the earliest in the sequence of first dynasty rulers. The so-called Giza king list is a wooden, gypsum-coated writing board which was found in a pit beside the old kingdom Mastaba tomb G1011 and is now in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. It is inscribed with the names of six old kingdom rulers from different dynasties. Finally, the most detailed historical source is the Egyptiaca 
A history of Egyptian rulers compiled by a Hellenicized Egyptian priest called Manepho in early Ptolemaic times, 3rd century BC. This has unfortunately survived only in the form of extracts quoted by much later historians, from Josephus, 1st century AD, to George Sincellus, early 9th century AD. Manetho was evidently able to consult both Egyptian sources, such as the royal annals described earlier, and also Greek historical texts. He probably wrote his history, dedicated to Ptolemy II, during the time that he was employed at the Temple of Sabonitos, near the modern town of Sanonod in the Delta. His division of the sequence of earthly, that is, post-mythological rulers into 30 dynasties, to which a 31st, the second Persian period was later added, has been a major influence on the conventional view of Egyptian chronology since the early 19th century. However, as the sources of Egyptian historical and archaeological data have inexorably expanded and diversified, with translations of new texts and excavations of fresh sites, it has become apparent that Manefo's chronological system is fatally flawed in one respect. It makes the basic assumption that there was one long sequence of Egyptian rulers governing the entire country, without overlaps between reigns and without fragmentation into many kingdoms. Over the years, researchers increasingly demonstrated that Egypt was, at various times, not culturally unified and politically centralized, with changes taking place at different speeds in the various regions. Other analyses show that short-term political events, which have tended to be regarded as the paramount factors in history, may often have been less historically significant than the gradual socio-economic processes that can change the cultural landscape more overwhelmingly in the long term. There are, in fact, several major problems with the traditional chronology. First, Manetho's history is frequently unreliable because we only have surviving quoted fragments rather than the whole original text, and because we do not know his sources. Second, there is often uncertainty regarding the lengths of King's reigns. For instance, the Turing Canon says that Senus Ret II and III have reigns of 19 and 39 years respectively, whereas their highest recorded regnal years on actual monuments are 6 and 19. Third, there's been a major problem with the so-called intermediate periods, which were once lazily interpreted as rather impenetrable, dark ages, but have gradually begun to be appreciated as complex and important chronological entities. Fourthly, there is still considerable controversy concerning overlaps between succeeding reigns, known as co-regencies, especially in the 6th and 18th dynasties. Finally, much of the traditional chronology hinges on ancient Egyptian documents that record astronomical observations, particularly the heliacal rising of the dog star Sirius, that is, the first morning in each year when this star became visible on the horizon just before sunrise. It began to be realized in the 1980s that the very small number of surviving texts that mentioned the heliacal rising of Sirius could provide different absolute dates depending on where the ancient astronomer priests made their observations. Some Egyptologists, such as Rolf Krauss, have suggested that all the sightings were made at one place, and that this place might usually have been Elephantine, which was not only the southernmost Egyptian city, whose inhabitants would therefore have been the first to see the heliacal rise in each year, but also the place most closely associated with measurement of the height of the annual inundation, which normally coincided with the heliacal rising of Sirius. Other scholars, such as William Ward, have argued that they must have all been local observations, that is, the religious festivals timed to coincide with astronomical events might actually have taken place on different days in different parts of the country. A papyrus from Lahun, Berlin 10012, dates a record of the heliacal rising of Sirius to the seventh year of the reign of Senesret III, which is often assumed to convert into an absolute date of 1872 BC. However, if the observation was made in Elephantine, the absolute date could have been as late as 1830 BC, whereas if it was made in the northern city of Memphis, it could have been as early as 1880 BC. The difference between these two dates is significant. It is, for instance, considerably longer than the average ancient Egyptian's lifespan in the 19th century BC, which is estimated to have been around 35 years even for elite men and 30 for elite women, the latter dying earlier on average because of the perils of ancient childbirth. 
Even the significance of the most basic historical divisions, that is, the distinctions between the pre-dynastic, pharaonic, Ptolemaic and Roman periods, has begun to be questioned. On the one hand, the results of excavations during the 1980s and 1990s in the cemeteries of Ulno Kaab at Abydos suggest that before the first dynasty there was also a dynasty zero, stretching back for some unknown period into the fourth millennium. This means that at the very least, the last one or two centuries of the pre-dynastic were probably in many respects politically and socially dynastic. Conversely, the increasing realization that late pre-dynastic pottery types were still widely used in the early dynastic period shows that certain cultural aspects of the pre-dynastic period continued on into the pharaonic period. The long pre-dynastic periods of Egyptian prehistory are inevitably understood as sequences of cultural rather than political developments. Now, the dynastic period, as well as the Ptolemaic and Roman periods, has begun to be understood not only as a traditional sequence of individual kings and ruling families, but also as a cultural continuum, in which there were gradual changes in such factors as the types of clay being used for pottery, and the styles and materials of many other types of artefact. Whereas there are definite political breaks between the Pharaonic and Ptolemaic periods, and between the Ptolemaic and Roman periods, the gradually increasing archaeological data from the two latter periods has begun to create a situation where the process of cultural change may be seen to be less sudden than the purely political records suggest. It's apparent, for instance, that many aspects of the ideology and material culture of the Ptolemaic period remain virtually unaltered by political upheavals. Instead of the arrival of Alexander the Great and his general Ptolemy representing a great watershed in Egyptian history, it might well be argued that, although there were certainly a number of significant political changes between the mid-first millennium BC and the mid-first millennium AD, these took place amid comparatively leisurely processes of social and economic change. Significant elements of pharaonic civilization survived relatively intact for several millennia, only undergoing a full combination of both cultural and political transformation at the beginning of the Islamic period in AD 641. A piece of wood from the steppe pyramid complex of the third dynasty ruler Jose was central to the first proof of effectiveness of radiocarbon dating in 1949, when Willard Libby and James Arnold published their analyses of several samples of material from Egypt and Turkey. Roughly speaking, radiocarbon dating relies on the fact that when any living thing dies, it ceases to absorb carbon from the environment, and the amount of the isotope carbon-12 remains constant, whereas the radioactive carbon-14 isotope decays at a predictable rate thus allowing scientists to assess the date of plant, animal or human remains in the archaeological record on the basis of the ratio between the remaining quantities of carbon-12 and carbon-14 isotopes. However, because the amount of radiocarbon in the Earth's atmosphere is not constant over time, a fact that Libby and Ward did not initially recognize, the raw radiocarbon dates all have to be calibrated by a technique using radiocarbon dated samples taken from long sequences of tree rings of known date from very long living species of tree such as the sequoia and the bristlecone pine. The use of this so-called calibration curve to convert radiocarbon dates into real, absolute ones means that scientists don't tend to be able to give a single absolute date, but rather they express the percentage of likelihood that the real date lies within a particular span of years. To give an actual example, a sample of pomegranate seeds from an 18th dynasty burial reusing a 5th dynasty tomb at Saqqara produced a raw date of 3195 BP, that is, 3195 radiocarbon years before AD 1950, which in conventional terms is equivalent to 1245 BC. The radiocarbon date was then calibrated, producing a 68.2% likelihood that the real absolute date lay somewhere between 1498 and 1437 BC which actually agrees very well with the estimates of dates for the 18th dynasty pottery and other artefacts found along with the seeds. <laughs>
Despite the fact that Egyptian objects played such a crucial role in the early development of radiocarbon dating itself, it's only comparatively recently that scientific dating of this kind has begun to be seriously incorporated into Egyptian chronology. For many years, the technique has been underused by historians of ancient Egypt, not only because of a misguided perception that the traditional chronology required very little help from science, and that the margins of error on radiocarbon dates were excessive compared to traditional dates, but also for the more practical reason that it has been almost impossible for most researchers to gain official permission to take samples out of Egypt for dating. Since there are few radiocarbon dating facilities within Egypt itself, opportunities for systematic radiocarbon dating of Egyptian material have been extremely limited. Nevertheless, in 2001, permission was given for systematic radiocarbon dating of over 450 Egyptian Old and Middle Kingdom samples in order to see how well they correlated with the traditional chronology. The results showed an intriguing mixture of correlations and discrepancies, but initially little attempt was made to assess the implications of these new calibrated dates. About a decade later, two new major dating projects, one in Oxford and another in Vienna, were published. Strikingly, however, they came up with very different overall results. The Oxford project was the first major application of the so-called Bayesian statistical method to radiocarbon dates from Egypt. The method uses not only dendrochronology, but also all kinds of other contextual chronological data, such as the order in which individual kings reigned and the traditional estimates of lengths of their reigns, in order to enhance the calibration process. The Oxford team reached the conclusion that their 200-plus radiocarbon dates all taken on short-lived material types such as papyrus, mostly from very secure archaeological contexts, were broadly in line with the traditional high chronology, that is, the version of the traditional Egyptian chronology that opts for slightly earlier dates. For the Middle Kingdom, for instance, the Oxford radiocarbon-based chronology seemed to validate the conventional assumption of a date of circa 1872 BC for the observation of a heliacal rising of Sirius in the reign of Senesret III. The results of the Vienna project were more problematic. Working with samples from Nanford Betax excavations of the Second Intermediate Period city and cemeteries at Tel El Daba, they found that the radiocarbon dates diverged quite significantly from Betax's own dates, which were based on such archaeological factors as stratigraphy, pottery seriations, and synchronisms with other Near Eastern and Mediterranean chronological sequences. There is absolutely no doubt that radiocarbon dating is finally beginning to have a more serious impact on Egyptian chronology and history. But there are clearly still issues to be resolved, and these are almost certainly issues connected with the traditional methods of chronology building rather than with the radiocarbon date. One of the most effective dating methods used by modern Egyptologists is the study of the styles and fabrics of pottery vessels, not least because fragments of pottery make up the vast majority of material from Egyptian archaeological sites. There's been an enormous growth in the study of Egyptian pottery in the last 50 years, both with regard to the quantity of sherds being analysed from a wide variety of types of site, and in terms of the range of scientific techniques now being used to extract more information from ceramics. Inevitably, the improvement in our understanding of this prolific aspect of Egyptian material culture has had an impact on the chronological framework. The way ahead in construction of Egyptian chronologies must surely lie in this kind of research. King lists and the like can only tell us about limited aspects of political change, the rise and fall of dynasties and individual rulers, whereas chronological frameworks based on particular elements of Egyptian material culture from sites throughout the country can provide information on the history of ancient Egyptian society and economy. Many modern histories of ancient Egypt therefore increasingly focus as much on social and cultural developments, such as evolving settlement patterns, exploitation and manufacture of different materials, and changes in diet and health, as on the traditional fare of kings, queens and dynasties. Egyptian hieroglyphs consist of ideograms, signs employed as direct representations of phenomena such as sky or man, as well as phonetic signs representing the sound of all or part of a spoken word.
The connections between writing and art were therefore much stronger in Pharaonic Egypt than in many other cultures. In the hieroglyphic script decorating buildings and sculptures, the writing of simple words such as goose or head was to some extent an artistic exercise as well as an act of verbal communication. A third type of hieroglyph is the determinative, which is so called because it determines, that is, categorizes, the meaning of the entire word. Thus, for example, a variety of words referring to movement conclude with a determinative comprising a pair of walking legs, and more abstract words, such as to know, are followed by a determinative in the form of a rolled-up papyrus, indicating that these words are concerned with thought and intellect. Many of the surviving texts from ancient Egypt were created in order to complement and annotate the paintings and reliefs decorating the surfaces of the walls and ceilings of temples and tombs. Both the appearance and function of Egyptian writing and art were therefore closely connected with religious beliefs and funerary practices, and the Egyptians appear to have believed strongly in the real physical potency of words and images. Indeed, in many inscriptions on tomb walls or funerary equipment, it was considered necessary to remove certain portions of hieroglyphs, such as the legs of bird signs, in order to incapacitate forces that might prove malevolent to the deceased. This sense of the magical potential of verbal and artistic representations was expressed in the funerary ritual known as the opening of the mouth in which both the mummies and statues of the deceased were thought to be imbued with new life. A variant of this ritual seems to have been performed each morning in tornate temples in order to bring to life the texts and images on the walls. Like many early artefacts, the Nama palette includes symbols that have been interpreted either as purely pictorial elements, as strings of unconnected pictograms, or even as organized grammatical sentences. What does this tell us about current views concerning the origins and nature of writing in Egypt? The pictorial narrative on the palette appears to be complemented by early hieroglyphs such as the catfish and chisel signs that hover in front of the smiting figure of the king. These two signs have the phonetic values na and mer respectively in pharaonic times, but it's not clear whether the signs on the palette are being used phonetically or ideogrammatically. Some scholars have suggested that the signs should actually be read as na ne he because the hieroglyphic sign chisel might be phonetically interpreted not as chisel, but aggressive. The king's name would then mean aggressive catfish, which perhaps makes better sense. The king's name is repeated at the top of each side of the palace, framed in a serac, which was a powerful symbol of kinship, probably representing the entrance to an early royal palace. We know that this Serac symbol was used from the late pre-dynastic period onwards as a way of framing and indicating one of the king's names, known to Egyptologists as his Horus name, because the Serac often has a Horus falcon perched protectively over it. There are, however, also a number of other signs on this side of the palette, which most Egyptologists interpret as early hieroglyphs. Opinions differ as to whether the four symbols at the top right of this side of the palace, immediately above the ten decapitated bodies, are hieroglyphs or pictures. In 1961, Alan Gardner went so far as to describe the palace's decoration, and particularly the group of symbols hovering in front of the face of the smiting Nana, as a complex of pictures which the spectator would then translate into words. In 1991, however, Walter Fairservice Jr. published an article setting out an even more philological interpretation. He argued that previous Egyptologists' interpretations of the Nama palette had been subject to a significant methodological flaw because they'd treated most of the decorated surface of the palette as pictorial rather than linguistic. Fair service took the highly controversial view that all of the symbols on both sides of the palette should be translated into grammatical phrases, written in a very early version of the Egyptian hieroglyphic system. In other words, he argued that, instead of interpreting the palette as a combination of art and writing, it should be literally read as one long sentence. He identified 62 putative hieroglyphs, and discussed the possible nuances of meaning contained in each of them, then assembled them into a form of text, on the basis of which he claimed that the palette was not a documentation of the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt, 
but instead represents a victory by the leader of the Edfu district over the Nile Valley south into Nubia. This theory is not generally accepted by other Egyptologists, but it does raise the question of the extent to which late pre-dynastic and early dynastic art includes fully developed writing of the spoken language as opposed to conveying information through purely artistic images. Like many early artefacts, the Nana palette includes symbols that have been interpreted either as purely pictorial elements, as strings of unconnected pictograms, or even as organized grammatical sentences. What does this tell us about current views concerning the origins and nature of writing in Egypt? The pictorial narrative on the palette appears to be complemented by early hieroglyphs such as the catfish and chisel signs that hover in front of the smiting figure of the king. These two signs have the phonetic values na and me respectively in pharaonic times, but it's not clear whether the signs on the palette are being used phonetically or ideogrammatically. Some scholars have suggested that the signs should actually be read as na meher because the hieroglyphic sign chisel might be phonetically interpreted not as chisel but aggressive. The king's name would then mean aggressive countfish, which perhaps makes better sense. The king's name is repeated at the top of each side of the palette, framed in a seric, which was a powerful symbol of kingship, probably representing the entrance to an early royal palace. We know that this Serac symbol was used from the late pre-dynastic period onwards as a way of framing and indicating one of the king's names, known to Egyptologists as his Horus name, because the Serac often has a Horus falcon perched protectively over it. There are, however, also a number of other signs on this side of the palette, which most Egyptologists interpret as early hieroglyphs. Opinions differ as to whether the four symbols at the top right of this side of the palette, immediately above the ten decapitated bodies, are hieroglyphs or pictures. In 1961, Alan Gardner went so far as to describe the palette's decoration, and particularly the group of symbols hovering in front of the face of the smiting Nana, as a complex of pictures which the spectator would then translate into words. In 1991, however, Walter Fairservice Jr. published an article setting out an even more philological interpretation. He argued that previous Egyptologists' interpretations of the Nama palette had been subject to a significant methodological flaw because they had treated most of the decorated surface of the palette as pictorial rather than linguistic. Fair service took the highly controversial view that all of the symbols on both sides of the palette should be translated into grammatical phrases, written in a very early version of the Egyptian hieroglyphic system. In other words, he argued that, instead of interpreting the palette as a combination of art and writing, it should be literally read as one long sentence. He identified 62 putative hieroglyphs and discussed the possible nuances of meaning contained in each of them, then assembled them into a form of text on the basis of which he claimed that the palette was not a documentation of the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt, but instead represents a victory by the leader of the Edfu district over the Nile Valley south into Nubia. This theory is not generally accepted by other Egyptologists, but it does raise the question of the extent to which late pre-dynastic and early dynastic art includes fully developed writing of the spoken language as opposed to conveying information through purely artistic images. Recent studies on the origins of the Egyptian writing system have focused on several specific questions. When did the hieroglyphic system first begin to be used, and when did it begin to incorporate phonetics and grammar? Was it adopted from another culture, the most likely candidate being the Near East, where writing seems to have emerged in Mesopotamia at a slightly earlier date, or did it emerge independently in Egypt? And if so, could it have been invented by a single individual or a small group of innovators, as opposed to evolving slowly over a number of generations or centuries? Another question that tends to be asked about all early writing systems is whether they emerged through practical bureaucratic requirements or whether their initial development was much more concerned with ritualistic and ceremonial purposes. Were the earliest Egyptian hieroglyphs a kind of propagandist tool used by rulers and elite groups to preserve their own power? <laughs> 
The answer to this question is complicated by the fact that our views of the dates at which writing emerged in different cultures, and also the purposes for which it was initially used, are very much determined by the kinds of materials used as writing media, for example clay tablets, bone and ivory labels, rolls of papyrus and stone monuments, and by their ability to survive in the environmental conditions that prevail in different parts of the world. Because the clay tablets used for administrative records in early Mesopotamia were well preserved by the local conditions, they gave the impression to some scholars that writing had emerged to serve bureaucratic purposes, whereas in Mesoamerica, China and Egypt, it appeared that the earliest inscribed objects, such as Maya stone stele and Egyptian stone palettes, were used for ceremonial purposes, primarily concerned with the maintenance of power by an elite group. This cross-cultural view of writing, of course, ignores the fact that, by their very nature, administrative archives in most early societies will tend to have been inscribed on cheaper, less durable materials, such as papyrus in Egypt, which is known to have been in use as early as the First Dynasty. Such low-cost bureaucratic materials will therefore not tend to survive very well, whereas the earliest ceremonial and propagandist texts are characteristically written on highly durable materials, primarily stone, which are far more likely to have survived. Of course, it might also be argued that the idea of making a binary distinction between administrative and ceremonial propagandist texts is a slightly dubious one and that textual genres may be particularly difficult to characterize at the time that ancient texts are first emerging. The general assumption, until comparatively recently, was that the first examples of the Sumerian cuneiform writing system appeared significantly earlier than the Egyptian hieroglyphs. It was therefore further assumed that the first Egyptian texts, which seemed to have emerged relatively abruptly at the end of the 4th millennium BC, were probably inspired by increased Egyptian links with the Near East. However, the actual signs making up the two systems, Sumerian cuneiform and Old Egyptian hieroglyphs, are so different that it seems highly unlikely that the Egyptian system evolved directly out of cuneiform. This does not mean, however, that the basic idea of pictographic writing could not have emerged from Mesopotamia and simply been emulated in a more general sense. These assumptions were somewhat unravelled by archaeological discoveries made by German archaeologists at Abydos during the 1990s, which suggested not only that the hieroglyphic script might have already begun to be used in the middle of the pre-dynastic period, at least as early as 3300 BC, but also that the use of phonetic signs might have appeared much earlier than previously thought. The excavations at Tun Uj, the impressive burial of a ruler called Scorpion, evidently an earlier scorpion than the owner of the mace head found near the Nama palette, revealed one room containing about 150 small ivory labels that appear to bear clearly recognisable hieroglyphs, including numbers, commodities, and possibly also place names or royal agricultural estates. The importance of these labels is that they are perhaps not just inscribed with pictorial signs, ideograms, which would represent a much more basic stage in the history of the script. Instead, many of them may be representations of sounds in the spoken language, phonograms, a stage in the development of the script that was not thought to have occurred until at least the First Dynasty. The German philologists who studied the labels identified them as phonetic symbols because they often appear to spell out the names of well-known towns frequently mentioned in later inscriptions, such as Buto and Bubastis. Not all Egyptologists agree with these interpretations of the symbols carved onto the labels, but most would agree with the basic premise that they are at least some form of proto-script and that their purpose was to communicate meaning through symbols. In a recent discussion of the origins of Egyptian hieroglyphs, Andreas Stauder takes a minimalist view of the significance of the UJ labels, arguing that they do not evidence representation of language and are best interpreted as a non-linguistic marked system. Although he does acknowledge that the inscriptions display some important features of writing, such as regimentation of forms, orientation and miniaturization, Notwithstanding Stauder's caution, it appears that some of the craftsmen employed by the earliest rulers at Abydos, at least 200 years before the First Dynasty, were already using a sophisticated form of symbolic communication, 
perhaps involving phonetic signs as well as ideograms. Culturally speaking, the fact that this writing may often refer to lower Egyptian place names as the sources of goods placed in an upper Egyptian ruler's tomb is also very strong evidence that the northern and southern halves of Egypt were already closely connected economically and perhaps politically too. Thus, many of the factors conventionally associated with fully developed states, such as writing, bureaucracy, monumental architecture, and complex systems of exchange and economic control, were evidently in place in Egypt as a time when the culture was, until comparatively recently, conventionally regarded as prehistoric. The beginning of Egyptology is a complete historical discipline, combining the study of both texts and archaeology, was made possible by Champollion's decipherment of Egyptian hieroglyphs in 1822. By the late 1820s, the Demotic script had also been deciphered, largely by Thomas Young. Thus, within a single decade, ancient Egyptian culture had been dragged from prehistory into history. By the 1860s, Charles Goodwin and Francois Chabas had deciphered and translated many papyri inscribed with the Hieratic script, thus ensuring that text in all four Egyptian scripts, hieroglyphics, Hieratic, Demotic and Coptic, could now be understood. Coptic, the last phase of the ancient Egyptian language, still spoken as recently as the 10th century AD, has of course survived into modern times in written form as the liturgical language of the Coptic Church. Almost from the moment that hieroglyphs, hieratic and demotic began to be translated, research into pharaonic Egypt was increasingly characterized by a struggle to reconcile the kinds of general socio-economic evidence preserved in the archaeological record with the more specific historical information contained in ancient texts. While the newly discovered knowledge of the texts had the potential to revive the very thoughts and the notions of the ancient Egyptians, it also introduced a temptation to assume that the answers to questions about Egyptian civilization could be found in the written word rather than the archaeologist's trench. The purely archaeological view of Egyptian culture, as it was preserved in the form of buried walls, artifacts and organic remains, would henceforth always have to be seen in the context of a richly detailed corpus of text written on stone, clay and papyrus. In Egyptian archaeology, as in other historical disciplines, the written word, with all its potential for subjectivity and persuasion, can have a paradoxical tendency to obscure and sometimes even eclipse the physical archaeological evidence. It's interesting, from the point of view of the dichotomy between texts and archaeology, to compare the history of Egyptian archaeology with that of modern Maya studies. Mayanists appear to have experienced the reverse situation, their discipline was predominantly anthropological and archaeological until Maya glyphs began to be deciphered in the 1980s, producing a sudden flood of texts in the Mayan language which have significantly altered the perception of the Maya culture. The suspicion with which Maya archaeologists initially regarded the historical information provided by their philological colleagues presents a mirror image of the reaction of many traditional text-based Egyptologists to the increasingly science-based and anthropological analyses of pharaonic Egypt produced by archaeologists in recent years. Both Mayanists and Egyptologists are struggling to come to terms with the basic fact that writing tends to be the product of elite members of society, whereas the bulk of archaeological data derives from the illiterate majority of the population. The solution lies in the successful integration of these types of evidence to produce a view of society as a whole. There have in the past been many syntheses of ancient Egyptian textual and archaeological material, but increasingly, as the sheer amount of both types of data continues to grow, linguists and archaeologists seem to have taken somewhat divergent paths. In a discussion of the administration of Nubia in the Middle Kingdom, employing both textual and archaeological data, Larry Kemp argues that textual sources usually only reveal fragments of systems often lacking a sense of physical and cultural context, whereas archaeology can suggest the broad structural outlines in society. Nevertheless, there's no doubt that Egyptian textual evidence is often able to supply those personal details that help to transform abstract socio-economic processes into something that's closer to conventional history.
Often the problem is that archaeological and textual data are analyzed and interpreted entirely separately, rather than being blended and fused into more holistic views of Egyptian culture and history. Both of the faces of the Nama palace are decorated with warlike scenes of the king, but it's the large depiction of the king smiting a foreigner with his mace on the reverse of the palace that's probably the most potent image. The royal smiting scene is one of the most common images in Egyptian art, serving as a metaphor for the power of the pharaoh, who preserves the order of the universe by ritually subduing the forces of chaos. In 1899, the year after the discovery of the Nama palette itself, an earlier pre-dynastic version of the smiting scene was found by Frederick Green at Hierakonpolis on the wall of tomb 100, the first surviving Egyptian tomb to contain painted decoration. This burial seems to have been created for a local ruler at around 3600 BC, that is, the Nakada 2C phase of the pre-dynastic. Almost a century later, in the 1990s, and even an earlier example of the motif, China tall figure smiting three crouching captives, was found painted on a pottery vessel excavated from the pre-dynastic tomb U239 at Abydos, dated to the late Nakada I period, circa 3800 BC. The classic icon of the smiting pharaoh retained its significance for thousands of years, appearing in a variety of religious and artistic contexts, from amulets and stele to the walls and pylons of temples as late as the Roman period. One theme that repeatedly appears in Egyptological studies is the nature of the Egyptian king, and particularly his relationship both with his fellow mortals and with the Egyptian pantheon. The Nama palette already establishes a close link between the king and the falcon god Horus, with its depiction of the divine falcon holding a foreign captive in front of Nama. The interaction between king and god in the act of conquest conveys some of the complexity of the symbolism and metaphors surrounding the ancient Egyptian conceptions of kinship. The idea of the despotic pharaoh has found its way into the modern consciousness via many different means, from the Bible to Shelley, and Egyptologists have frequently used the debate concerning Egyptian kingship to explore such topics as the changing nature of the Egyptian political system and the question of what we can know of the identities of the various pharaohs as real individuals as opposed to iconographical ciphers. In the case of Egyptian rulers, so many of their mummified bodies have survived, especially from the New Kingdom, that we're in the unusual position of being able actually to gaze into their faces as if they were our contemporaries, while simultaneously examining the long ruined monuments and surviving texts from their reigns. For the Egyptians, the reign of each new king represented a new beginning, not merely philosophically, but practically, given the fact that dates were expressed in the form of the regnal years of each individual ruler. This means that there would probably have been a psychological tendency to regard each new reign as a fresh point of origin. Every king was essentially reworking the same universal myths of kingship within the events of his own time. By the late Old Kingdom, every king held five names, the so-called fivefold titulary, each of which encapsulated a particular aspect of the kingship. Three of them stressed his role as a god, while the other two emphasized the supposed division of Egypt into two unified lands. Many rulers held the titles Mighty Bull and Bull of Horus. Both of the depictions of Nama on the pallet show him wearing a bull's tail hanging from his waist as part of the royal regalia. The figure of the bull, trampling a fallen foreigner and breaking through the walls of a city, depicted on the lower part of the front of the Nama palette, is probably symbolic of the king's victory over foreign territories. The strong identification between king and bull continued throughout the pharaonic period. There was perhaps an element of punning involved in the king-bull correlation, in that the Egyptian term for bull was ka, which was phonetically identical to another word often used to refer to the king's divine counterpart or double. A great deal of metaphor and symbolism was involved in the king's names and iconography. This has made it difficult for modern scholars to use these kinds of evidence to arrive at a sense of the individual characteristics and activities of particular kings as opposed to the general idea of kingship. In reading Egyptologists' accounts of the reigns of various pharaohs, we have to consider two kinds of stereotyping and pigeonholing. 
First, the ancient stereotypes that the original Egyptian texts present us with, and second, the unconscious contemporary stereotyping of which Egyptologists themselves are sometimes guilty. One particular victim of regal stereotyping was the 18th dynasty ruler Amenhotep II, who is repeatedly portrayed on his monuments as a great sporting hero. Alan Gardner, in 1961, described him as follows. His muscular strength was extraordinary. We're told that he can shoot at a metal target of one palm's thickness and pierce it in such a way that his arrow would stick out on the other side. Unhappily, the like had been related of Thutmose of the Third, though with less detail, so that we're not without excuse for scepticism. Nonetheless, there are other examples of his athletic prowess too individual to be rejected out of hand. In the 1980s, the French Egyptologist Nicolas Grimal even saw these traits in Amenhotep's names and epithets, such as his Horus and Golden Horus names, Powerful Bull with Great Strength, and He Who Seizes All the Lands by Strength, respectively. The problem of whether Amenhotep II was actually an unusually athletic king, however, is much more a question of unpicking formulaic details from idiosyncratic facts. First, is it simply a case of accident of survival, whereby more texts concerning athleticism happen to have been preserved from the time of Amenhotep II than from other reigns? Second, if it's not an accident of survival, do we interpret this as an indication that the king was actually a great sportsman, or do we simply credit him with making an enormous contribution to the idea of the Egyptian king being a great athlete? When confronted by the question of individual pharaoh's distinctive personalities, as preserved in the visual and textual record, many Egyptologists, and a number of other scholars, have naturally been tempted to speculate as to their characters and motivations. This second question in particular leads us inevitably to the much caricatured Hatshepsut, one of a very small group of women, perhaps five altogether over a period of thousands of years, who managed to rule Egypt in their own right, rather than as appendages of male rulers. The term queen is frequently applied to royal females in Egypt, but Egyptologists use it at their peril, since there's no real ancient Egyptian word for an independent female ruler. Only a few phrases used to describe women related by blood or marriage to the ruling male, principally the great royal wife, the royal mother, and the royal wives. This meant that in those rare situations when women became kings themselves, they were virtually obliged to adopt male regalia and attributes. Certainly Hatshepsut, who is the female ruler for whom most evidence has survived, had herself portrayed for much of her reign as if she were physically male. In her cult temple at Deir el-Bahari, and in other monuments, she is frequently shown in male kingly costume, including the royal false beard. There must presumably have been some sense of conflict between her sex and the masculine role of the pharaoh, but only the posthumous erasures of her name from monuments have survived as indications of such feelings of inappropriateness. Interestingly, her royal names and titles are regularly written with feminine grammatical endings, and one of them perhaps deliberately recalls one of the names of the Middle Kingdom female ruler Sobeneferu, producing a set of word plays connecting her with certain deities and aspects of divinity that would not have been possible with a male king's nomenclature. Almost certainly because of Hatshepsut's gender, there's been a tendency for many Egyptologists to stereotype her as a pacifist. Nicholas Grimal's History of Egypt, published in the 1980s, argued that her only real foray into the outside world was the trading mission to the land of Pund. This expedition to Pund, recounted in great detail on the walls of Hatshepsut's mortuary temple, represented the high point of a foreign policy that was limited to the exploitation of the Wadi Magara mines in Sinai and the dispatch of one military expedition into Nubia. During the reign of Hatshepsut, the only military actions were to consolidate the achievements of Thutmose the I. In the 1960s, however, the Canadian Egyptologist Donald Redford had already put forward a revisionist view of the Queen's reign, suggesting that unjustified assumptions were being made on the basis of an apparent absence of evidence rather than actual facts 
He makes the point that some male rulers, such as Horonheb and Shoshen I, might be wrongly regarded as pacifists if the same conclusions were drawn on the basis of a paucity of text describing military expeditions. In the case of Horemeb, we have ample evidence from his pre-royal career as Tutankhamun's general to know that he was anything but a pacifist. Another debate concerning the reign and personality of Hatshepsut centers on the two closely connected questions of whether she was a weak ruler who used an unusual amount of propaganda to bolster her claims to the throne, and whether she was unusually influenced by her male steward, Senenut. We therefore find Redford suggesting in 1967 that there can be no doubt that her chief supporter was her steward, Senenmut, a man of low origin, who throughout most of her reign appears to have been something of a power behind the throne. She had a circle of favourites, a motley collection of individuals with no common background and little reason to share political goals. Redford goes on to argue that Hatshepsut was then generally eclipsed as Thutmose III began to appear more often in reliefs and was delegated the task of undertaking foreign wars. However, none of this was different from any other co-regency between a king and his successor. Egyptian princes generally were given greater prominence in order to prepare them for the kingship. Fortunately, the French Egyptologist Suzanne Rattier presents a much more nuanced view of Hatshepsut's relationship with Senenmut. The personality of Senenmut was therefore rich and complex. Certain aspects of his career are impenetrable. It seems that his influence is visible in all the great achievements of the reign at least until year 16. It's difficult to differentiate the role played by the Queen and her advisor in various decisions and activities. We use the term advisor to describe Senenmut, but we deliberately avoid the use of the term favourite, for this aspect of the lives of Hatshepsut and Senenmut is completely out of our reach and does not rest on any objective evidence. Finally, a third historical debate concerning Hatshepsut centres on a relief in her mortuary temple at Deir el-Bahari that appears to justify her right to the throne by portraying her birth as the result of sexual intercourse between the god Amun and her human mother, Ahnusa. There are a very small number of royal monuments from the New Kingdom that also contain claims that the ruler in question was the result of sexual intercourse between a deity and a woman for example, the scenes of the divine birth of Amenhotep III at Luxor, thus suggesting that the ruler was physically semi-divine. It's possible that such scenes might originally have been standard parts of many royal monuments, and that it is only by chance that they have survived from certain reigns and not others. However, it is also possible, as many Egyptologists have argued, that some rulers were more concerned to stress their legitimacy than others. Egyptologists have frequently speculated as to whether these so-called scenes of divine birth of Hatshepsut and Amenhotep III at Deir al-Bahari and Luxor Temple respectively were propagandistic or religious documents, or perhaps both at the same time. It has been frequently argued that Hatshepsut's gender forced her to come up with new methods of justifying her position, but this does not explain why Amenhotep III, and later also Ramesses II in some less substantial surviving scenes, should have felt the need to utilise the myth of divine birth when none of Hatshepsut's gender problems applied. In The Miraculous Birth of King Amenhotep III and Other Egyptian Studies, 1912, Colin Campbell argued that the reasons for the birth scenes of both Hatshepsut and Amenhotep III were largely religious rather than political, being concerned with the replacement of the cult of Ra in the kingship by that of Amun, so that the aim was to establish the king as the son of Amun rather than the son of the sun god Ra. It's been pointed out, however, that Amun was already being described as the king's father as early as the reign of Ahmosa, three generations before Hatshepsut. Essentially, the question of Hatshepsut's motivation for stressing her divine birth remains uncertain. Although patchy data can always lead to interpretive problems, there can be little doubt that these three problems with late 20th century interpretations of the reign of Hatshepsut derive, at least partly, from Egyptologists' assumptions and personal prejudices which caused them not only to interpret the evidence in misleading ways, but to deliberately build up semi-fictionalized images of the female ruler, 
no doubt bringing to the topic a wide range of largely inappropriate later female royal stereotypes from Western history, such as Elizabeth I, Victoria, and even Catherine the Great. Apart from Hatshepsut, two other Egyptian queens who have received the full treatment in posthumous personality profiling are Nefertiti, one of whose sculptures has become a kind of celebrity in its own right, and Cleopatra VII, the last of the Ptolemaic rulers and a considerable cinematic icon. I'll discuss the reputations and multifarious influences of Nefertiti and Cleopatra in Chapter 9, Egyptomania, since these two Egyptian queens have undoubtedly crossed over into the arena of modern popular culture. A considerably more conventional, but nevertheless still stereotyped, view of Egyptian kingship is encountered in the case of Ramesses II, who seems to have begun to be regarded as some kind of archetype, even in his own lifetime. He was evidently much admired and envied by his successors, such as Ramesses III, who, only thirty years after his more illustrious predecessor's death, not only dedicated a chapel to the deified Ramesses II at Medinet Habu, but also gave his own sons the same names as Ramesses II's sons. By the 11th century BC, Ramesses II had become such a powerful mythological figure that one 21st Dynasty Book of the Dead Papyrus, British Museum, EA 75026, attempted to gain extra potency by identifying itself as the writing which was found on the neck of the mummy of King Yusimari, Ramesses II. It's also clear that Ramesses had become very closely associated with the institution of Egyptian kingship itself, from the fact that, in the Third Intermediate Period, priests and high officials were sometimes given the title King the Son of Ramesses, showing the great power of the name Ramesses alone. Ramesses II's memory would live on in later traditions, both under his own name and under that of Sesostris the latter being the name of several Middle Kingdom rulers whose monuments Ramesses had served during his lifetime, and his reputations were also inexorably absorbed into his own. In the 5th century BC, Herodotus described a character called Ramsonitis, whom he credits with the building of the gateways of the western end of the precinct of Tyre at Nymphus, also suggesting that he was a frequent visitor to the underworld. In his histories, Herodotus describes two events in the reign of Ramsonitis, who seems to be a semi-mythologized mixture of Ramesses II and III. The first is an account of how the king played dice in the underworld, and the second tells of a cunning theft from the king's treasury and his attempts to thwart the thieves. About 400 years later, in the early 1st century BC, Diodorus Siculus describes a monument that he calls the Tomb of the Osinandias. This appears to be the Ramesseum, Ramesses II's mortuary temple in western Thebes, and the name Osimandias was the Hellenicization of Usern Matra, Ramesses II's prenomen. A version of this name appeared again in 1817 when Percy Bysshe Shelley published a sonnet called Osimandias that included the famous lines, My name is Osimandias, King of Kings, look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Shelley, in fact, never visited Egypt, and was probably inspired by visits visit to the British Museum. A few months before he wrote the Ossimandius sonnet, he had spent an evening with John Keats and James Henry Lee Hunt, writing poems about the River Nile. The poem is clearly indebted to Diodorus Siculus, and Shelley had perhaps also read William Hamilton's guidebook to Egypt, Egyptiarca, published in 1809. It's also probably significant that it was in 1817 that the British Museum received part of the colossal statue of Ramesses called the Young Memnon, brought back from the second court of the Ramesseum by Balzoni as a gift from Muhammad Ali to the Prince Regent. Ramesses has also endured a rich fictional afterlife, with a sequence of novels written about him by the Egyptologist-turned-novelist Christian Jack in the 1990s, as well as Anne Rice's The Mummy or Ramesses the Damned, 1989, in which Ramesses is resurrected by a magic elixir along with Cleopatra. The approach to Ramesses II, from the late New Kingdom through to 20th century accounts of his life and reign, seems to have been to allow him to serve as a kind of amalgam of the classic traits of arrogance and despotism that tend to be regarded as appropriate to Egyptian kingship. 
Finally, one of Ramesses' most even-handed biographers, Kenneth Kitchen, attempts to protect Ramesses from such careless typecasting, but in the process seems to create a rather genial monarch. Criticising his fellow Egyptologists for their pigeonholing of Ramesses, he speculates as to what the king would make of the modern world. Initially, perhaps, he would be dazzled by the technology and sciences, but before very long he would see through the material facade and, in quest of might, perceive also the reverse of the coin, in a world cursed with exactly the same basic human rivalries and failings that he knew in his own world. Finally, he would doubtless also see the abiding positive values of love, devotion, regard for right, a certain mutual tolerance on non-essentials. If the traditional despotic view of Ramesses is disturbing, then how much more disturbing is Kitchen's concept of Ramesses as a kind of Archbishop of Canterbury? For a genuine dose of realism on the stereotypes of Egyptian kingship, we should perhaps turn to Jan Asman, who, in The Search for God in Ancient Egypt, describes the way in which kingship seems to lie at the heart of Egyptian creation myths. The starting point was the king. He was the incarnation of the god Horus, the son who ever and again has to overcome the death of his father to gain his throne. The Ennead, group of known creation deities, before whom he must prove that he is the rightful heir to the throne, is both his family and the cosmos itself. Read in descending order, his genealogy is a cosmogony. This passage gives some sense of the context of most of the texts and images that have survived from the reigns of Amenhotep II, Hatshepsut, and Ramesses II, and with all this cosmic imagery, we should be grateful that we can catch any faint glimpses of individuality and personality from the sources. If Egyptian rulers sound arrogant, this is because they were obliged to see themselves, at least in theory, as the linchpins of humanity and the universe. The Nama palette includes scenes in which either the king himself or his divine alter egos, the falcon god Horus on one side and Mbul on the other, dispatch or humiliate foreigners and enemies. As we have heard, these images are part of the paraphernalia of Egyptian stereotypical kingship, but they're also part of the iconography through which the ancient Egyptian population perhaps defined and reaffirmed themselves as a people and as a nation, in contrast to what they saw as the chaotic sea of foreignness that lay beyond their borders. It is unclear whether the figure held in captivity by the Horus Falcon on the Nama Palette was a Libyan or an Asiatic, or whether this was a case of civil war and the prisoner is a lower Egyptian in the process of being forcibly integrated into a united upper and lower Egyptian kingdom. We might also ask whether the two prone figures in the lower part of the palette, and also the decapitated and emasculated human figures on the other side of the palette, are lower Egyptians or foreigners. Did Upper Egyptians regard Lower Egyptians as quasi-foreigners during the final phase of the pre-dynastic? Were the king and his courtiers not Egyptian themselves, but invaders from the Near East, as Egyptologists such as Petri and Emery argued? If so, which figures on the palette were the true Egyptians? The Iconography of Egypt's Early Ethnic Identity it seems, in fact, that the Nama palette may have a particular significance with regard to the early pharaonic Egyptians' definition of their own national identity. As far as we know, Nama is the last ruler to be depicted as an animated version of the creature after which he is named. Hence, Nama's ivory label and cylinder seal both show a somewhat improbably anthropomorphized catfish in the act of smiting foreign captives, whereas the palette bears not only the bestial symbols of pharaohs, falcon and bull, but also the image of the smiting human figure of the king. Questions of identity undoubtedly pervade the Nama palette just as they permeate the study of ancient Egypt as a whole. What was it like to be an ancient Egyptian, and how did they distinguish themselves from neighbouring peoples? Were they a distinctively African civilization, or one of several variants of standard Near Eastern culture? Could we define them by their language, their geographical location, or their physical appearance? How did they see themselves? In many ways, the Egyptians defined themselves and their rulers by establishing and emphasizing sharp contrasts with non-Egyptians in Africa and the Near East. 
The regions with which Egypt gradually fostered commercial and political links can be grouped into three basic areas. Africa, primarily Nubia, Libya and Pund. Asia, Syria, Palestine, Mesopotamia, Arabia and Anatolia. And the northern and eastern Mediterranean, Cyprus, Crete, the Sea Peoples and the Greeks. The Nanak palette may also have something to say about early Egyptian contact with the outside world. In 1955, an analysis by the Israeli archaeologist Yigael Yadin led to the suggestion that the Nana palette might not simply be a series of scenes celebrating kingly power or ritual, nor even, as the older theories suggested, a narrative of the unification of Egypt. Instead, Yadin argued that it might show early Egyptian military conflict with the Near East. He focused on the two prone figures below the large smiting figure of King Nana. These two human figures appear to be identified in some way by a pair of hieroglyph-like signs. The left-hand sign seems to be the rectangular outline of a fortified enclosure, while the right-hand one, if it is also an architectural image, might be seen as a semicircular enclosure with two walls fanning out from it. Yadin suggests that this right-hand sign might be the Egyptian's rendition of a peculiar kite-shaped enclosure, that is, diamond-shaped, with a pair of hanging strings when viewed from above, built by nomadic pastoralists. Many examples of these buildings have survived in the Hamad Desert near the modern city of Anan, where they're thought to have served as fortified enclosures into which animals could be herded in order to protect them from raiding parties. If these two architectural images identify the places of origin of the two figures, the first may represent the fortified enclosures that might have been encountered by Egyptians campaigning in early Bronze Age Palestine, and the second may portray the kite-like structures associated with the nomadic pastoralists of the Transjordanian region. Interestingly enough, excavations at the early Bronze Age one sites of Tel Arani and Arad in Israel have revealed Egyptian potsherds bearing the name of Nana written in a seric frame, along with many other Egyptian artifacts, including prestige items such as mace heads of similar date. This suggests that there was certainly a strong Egyptian presence in Palestine in the late 4th millennium BC, which might therefore provide some archaeological support for Yadin's theory of very early Egyptian military expansion into the land. How did the Egyptians view themselves? We can try to answer this question first by looking at the way in which they portrayed themselves in painting and sculpture, and second by analysing their depictions of foreigners. As in many other cultures, the Egyptians seem to have gained a sense of their own identity, primarily by contrasting themselves with the peoples of the world outside their borders. Scenes in the tombs of the New Kingdom pharaohs Seti I and Ramesses III in the Valley of the Kings specifically depict the various human types in the universe over which the sun god Ra presided. Although partly based on skin color and other physical characteristics, these different ethnicities were also based on varieties in hairstyles and costume and their function was apparently to allow the Egyptians to define themselves as a national group relative to the rest of the world. Such depictions, however, would have been recognized by the Egyptians themselves as simplified stereotypes, given that the thousands of portrayals of individual Egyptians show that the population as a whole ranged across a heterogeneous spectrum of ethnicities as in Egypt today. There is, therefore, also a sense in which the ancient Egyptians regarded themselves as a distinct population in purely cultural terms. There are many examples of individuals whom Egyptians regarded as identical to themselves in social and political terms, despite the fact that they were obviously foreign in their physical appearance. One good example of this is Mayhopri, a military official in the early 18th dynasty who was granted the great privilege of a tomb in the Valley of the Kings, but whose physical features clearly indicate that he was of Nubian extraction. On the Asiatic side, a man called Aperel, whose name indicates his Near Eastern roots, rose to the rank of vizier, the highest civil office below that of the king himself, in the late 18th dynasty. And there were many other Asiatics who gained powerful positions among the Egyptian elite at this date. In 2017, a pioneering scientific project showed fresh light on the question of Egyptian physical and genetic links with sub-Saharan Africa and the Near East.
Researchers from the University of Tübingen and the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History in Jena successfully recovered and analyzed ancient DNA from over 150 Egyptian mummies from Abu Sir al Melek, dating widely between circa 1400 BC and AD 400. Surprisingly, perhaps, their analyses, based on mitochondrial genomes from 90 individuals, suggested that modern Egyptians share more ancestry with sub-Saharan Africans than ancient Egyptians did, whereas ancient Egyptians were found to be most closely related to ancient people from the Near East. Possible causal factors for this increase in sub-Saharan ancestry in the Egyptian population during the last millennium are, firstly, improved mobility down the Nile, second, increased long-distance trade between sub-Saharan Africa and Egypt, and finally, the trans-Saharan slave trade, which began approximately 1,300 years ago. Viewpoints surrounding the issue of whether Egypt was fundamentally a black civilization, often described as an Afrocentric position, led to a lot of controversy in the 1980s and even earlier. Afrocentrism has a long history, extending at least as far back as 1827, when an editorial in Freedom's Journal, the first black newspaper in the USA, proposed a relationship between Africans and ancient Egyptians. A wide spectrum of Afrocentrist arguments have been advanced and largely discredited. The most influential and controversial arguments are those presented by Martin Bernal in his three-volume work, Black Athena, published between 1987 and 2006. Bernal claimed that ancient Egypt had been widely underestimated as an important stimulus for Western civilization, but both Egyptologists and classical scholars have pointed out many flaws in his archaeological and linguistic arguments and data, including, for instance, lack of evidence for his hypothesized Egyptian colonization of the Greek islands. The classicist Sarah Morris, writing in the 1990s when Afrocentrist controversies were at their height, argued that Bernal's work has bolstered, in ways not anticipated by the author, an Afrocentrist agenda which returns many debates to ground zero and demolishes decades of scrupulous research by excellent scholars. There is no doubt, however, that some Egyptologists in the past have been guilty of racist interpretations of the Egyptians. At the most heinous end of the scale, Croft and Elliot Smith suggested in 1909 that the smallest infusion of Negro blood immediately manifests itself in a dying of initiative and a drag on the further development of the arts of civilization. It is also difficult to read the theories advanced by Flinders Petrie concerning the establishment of Pharaonic Egypt by an invading Near Eastern or even European master race without being aware of his right-wing political views. He wrote a pamphlet on the dangers of socialism and the fact that he was an enthusiastic member of the eugenics movement, which was dedicated to improving human stock by the study of agencies under social control that may improve or impair the racial qualities of future generations, according to its founder, the anthropologist Sir Francis Galton. Brian Emery's espousal of invasion theories concerning early Egypt, on the other hand, was no doubt influenced more by the diffusionist ideas of Gordon Child, but also perhaps by pre-war British colonialism in Egypt and the Sudan. Perhaps the last word on this should be left to see Lauren Brace, writing in 1996. The race concept did not exist in Egypt, and it is not mentioned in Herodotus, the Bible, or any of the other writings of classical antiquity. Because it has neither biological nor social justification, we should strive to see that it is eliminated from both public and private usage. Its absence will be missed by no one, and we shall all be better off without it. R.I.P. Questions of Egyptian identity have occupied Egyptologists for almost as long as the subject has existed. But there are some aspects of selfhood that have been less frequently addressed, probably because Egyptologists have disproportionately tended to be white European or North American male academics. The heads of the cow goddess Bat at the top of the Nana palette appear to be the only female elements of the palette's decoration, and one Egyptologist, the art historian Whitney Davis, has argued that even these may actually be the heads of a bull god. <laughs>
The palette, like the majority of Egyptian art and texts, is essentially a male-dominated artefact. This raises the question of what we know of women in ancient Egypt, and indeed what we know of the Egyptians' own views on gender and sexuality. Which aspects of Egyptian society were overtly or implicitly moulded by male, female or queer concerns? When we look at the patterning of gender in Egyptian textual and visual sources, it's almost immediately apparent that male images and concerns are much more frequent and prominent than those of women. This male skew in the data occurs in a number of different ways, some obvious and others much more subtle and insidious. As we have heard with the summary of views of Queen Hatshepsut's reign, very few women reached the office of ruler during almost three millennia of the pharaonic period. In tomb chapels, women are regularly secondary figures, since the tombs were nearly always intended primarily for their fathers, husbands or sons. In its texts and artistic iconography, Egypt was androcentric from at least the first dynasty onwards. This is partly a false impression conveyed by our biased selection of data, but it was also, in some respects, how it actually was in Egyptian society, with virtually all women being excluded from administration and the writing and reading of texts, although, since at least 95% of men were probably also illiterate, this may be a less significant factor. Women were also frequently invisible in the world of work, with the notable exception of textile production, brewing and baking, although men are also shown engaged in these activities. Tomb paintings and wooden funerary models regularly show women spinning and weaving, and sometimes housed in flax in agricultural scenes, and some texts indicate that this was one of the main activities in the royal household a fact that seems to have escaped many Victorian Orientalist painters when they were evoking scenes of Pharaoh's harem. In the past, Egyptologists simply took this situation for granted, making little effort to unpick the roles and lifeways of women from this male-oriented documentation. In the last 50 years, however, as the numbers of female professional Egyptologists have increased, not surprisingly, greater attempts have been made to read between the lines in search of evidence for women's lives and achievements. It has become apparent, for instance, that the situation changed over time, so that there were actually three phases of the pharaonic period when women were more visible in the surviving documentation. In the Old Kingdom, when they were allowed to hold some administrative posts, although only being placed in charge of groups of women. In the early 18th dynasty, when women were more frequently featured on funerary monuments, probably reflecting their greater ability to take part in funerary rituals. And in the period from the late 20th to the early 22nd dynasty, when they not only appeared more often in the decoration of tomb chapels, but were also increasingly shown without any male relatives in attendance. Inevitably, perhaps, given Egyptologists' long-standing predisposition to the study of elite monuments, much of the early work concentrated on research into royal and privileged women, such as Hetaferes, the mother of Khufu, Sobaneferu, a female ruler at the end of the 12th dynasty, Hatshepsut, and Nefertiti. Gradually, however, greater effort has been applied to the extraction of information on women of all classes and wealth levels, and this shift of focus has been greatly assisted and encouraged by the tendency of newly favoured settlement archaeology to produce the kind of objective socio-economic evidence that at least has the potential to reveal the more female-oriented aspects of Egypt. Those parts of domestic and public life that male documents and artistic images can render invisible are sometimes considerably more obvious in the archaeological record. A note of caution, however, needs to be sounded when it comes to analysing houses for patterns of use by different genders, since it would be all too easy to make unwarranted ethnocentric assumptions concerning definitions of male and female space. For example, women, kitchen, men, reception room, women, bedroom. Another aspect of gender studies in which Egyptologists have often been guilty of ethnocentricity is the area of sexuality. In chapter 8, I discuss the fact that Egyptian religion includes an explicit focus on the phalluses of certain deities. 
Many Egyptologists, brought up almost entirely in the Judeo-Christian religious traditions, have, academically speaking, averted their eyes from this phallocentrism, regarding it, consciously or subconsciously, as somehow inappropriate in a religious context. Broadly speaking, this led many scholars to attempt to downplay such episodes as the description of Artem's act of masturbation in order to create the next generation of deities, in the absence of any goddess with which to procreate. Only two books have so far been written on sex in Pharaonic and Greco-Roman Egypt, but one characteristic Egyptological assumption that both authors highlight is the conventional tendency to assign sexually related artifacts and images to the more anodyne area of fertility rather than acknowledging overtly sexual images and activities. As Lynn Mesco has put it, Within sexuality, not their fertility, that is pregnancy, is stressed in tomb scenes, and their sexual qualities were presumably a sought-after commodity in the afterlife, as were provisions of servants and food. Tom Hare, however, points out more cautiously that it may often be difficult to decide when representations are actually intended to be erotic or not. However attractive we may find the painting of a bare-breasted Egyptian woman or goddess, we would be rash to read into this an erotic interest beyond our own personal interest. This is because in formal canonical representation, adult women and goddesses are often depicted bare-breasted with the nipple of the forward breast delineated. He goes on to discuss the complexity of the picture we are presented with, given that statues show women in particular types of dress, which in this context conceal the breasts, and yet the same dresses in two-dimensional depictions may show one of the breasts. This appears to be some kind of artistic convention, rather than eroticization. On the other hand, he accepts that there's almost certainly deliberate sexuality observable in the appearance, in mid-18th century dynasty elite tunes, of fully nude female dancers, musicians and servants, and therefore suggests that, in these contexts, the female figure is clearly the object of the male subject's gaze. Evidence for Same-Sex Desire in Ancient Egypt while heterosexuality is relatively easy to find in Egyptian texts and images, the same cannot be said for same-sex relations. For this topic, there are only occasional clues and allusions, and even these are often disputed or difficult to interpret. In addition, as some researchers have pointed out, the very idea of heterosexuality and homosexuality as two distinct categories is something of a recent binary construct that we impose on the distant past at our peril. The situation is not helped by the fact that, compared with modern art and literature, ancient Egyptian sources are relatively low on overt sexual references, notwithstanding the phallocentricity of some of the religious motifs mentioned earlier. Sexual acts of any kind between individuals are rarely represented or discussed. A few notable artistic exceptions are the Turin erotic papyrus, some erotic ostracoth, and a well-known sketch found in the entrance of a Middle Kingdom tomb above Hatshepsut's mortuary temple, the latter often interpreted, highly speculatively, as a scene of the Queen being penetrated from behind by her official synonymous. The main literary allusion to same-sex intercourse takes place in various versions of the myth of Horus and Seth, and involves anal sex between the young god Horus and his uncle Seth. The earliest example of this appears in the pyramid texts. Horus has insinuated his semen into the backside of Seth. Seth has insinuated his semen into the backside of Horus. In later versions of the myth, such as the 20th dynasty papyrus Chester Beatty I, the narrative seems to stress Seth's role as the sodomizer, and the act seems to be very much about Seth exerting dominance over Horus. The implication is that the Egyptians at this date were neutral about homosexuality in itself, but focused more on the perceived weakness of the man being penetrated. One piece of evidence that has played a pivotal role in the search for evidence of same-sex relationships in Pharaonic Egypt is a fifth dynasty tomb at Saqqara, belonging to a pair of male royal manicurists named Nyanknun and Knumhotep, circa 2445-2421 BC. Not only did these two individuals share a tomb, but the sculptured relief images on the walls of the funerary chapel show them embracing one another. 
and in one case touching noses in a manner that can usually be taken to depict the act of kissing. Interestingly, both men appear to have had wives, but their female partners play a very minimal role in the tomb decoration, each appearing only about three or four times, whereas their husbands are betrayed around thirty times. As Nadine Chirpian has put it, let us say that, psychologically, there was no room for them in the tomb, especially in images such as those in which Niamhnon and Knumhotep embrace one another. It should of course be noted that not all researchers agree that these two individuals were lovers. A persistent alternative view is that they may have been twins, like the two men called Hor and Suti on a New Kingdom steel in the British Museum, who are said to have been born on the same day, and perhaps that they may even have been conjoined twins. Scholars such as Greg Reed have nevertheless argued strongly that the physical closeness and intimacy of Nyangnun and Knumhotep, including a double statue in which they are portrayed holding hands, seem to be comparable only with images in other tombs that show heterosexual couples. In one scene, for instance, Knumhotep is shown holding a lotus up to his nose in a manner which is almost always associated with women at this early date. A scene at the entrance to the innermost chamber of the tomb shows the two men embracing very closely, in a way that almost exactly parallels the embrace between Kahe and his wife Nerit Yetis in a nearby tomb of slightly earlier date. Despite readers' compelling arguments, many Egyptologists remain unconvinced that this is anything other than projection of modern views onto ancient imagery. Ethnicity, race, gender and sexuality in ancient Egypt are surely among the most controversial and fascinating areas of current Egyptological research. Since the modern Western world itself is deeply immersed in identity crises from ethnic cleansing and race hate to feminism and LGBT plus issues, it's hardly surprising that ancient Egyptian source material has become fresh grist to these mouths. The Nana Palette and the Nana Mace Head, two of the most significant artifacts from King Nama's reign, were both discovered at Hierakonvalis. The burial of Nama himself, however, has been identified at Abydos, 150 kilometers to the northwest of Hierakonvalis. His tomb seems to have been located alongside those of the other rulers of Dynasties 0 and 1 in Cemetery B at the site of On el Kab at the western edge of Abydos. It is, in fact, a slightly later First Dynasty tomb at Abydos, the burial of King Jir, perhaps Nana's grandson, that is most relevant to the subject of this chapter, the cult of Osiris and Egyptian attitudes to the dead. Jir's tomb, covering an area of 70 by 40 metres, including the subsidiary burials in rows, was the largest in the early dynastic royal cemetery at Abydos. It was here that Flinders Petrie found part of a linen-wrapped arm wherein precious bracelets, hidden in the north wall of the tomb, and therefore saved when the tomb was burned in ancient times. This may be the one surviving fragment of an actual royal body in the early dynastic cemetery as a whole, although sadly only the jewellery and a few of the linen bandages survive today, the former in the Egyptian Museum Cairo and the latter in the Petrie Museum, University College London removing any real possibility of the Lin being scientifically dated to establish or refute its contemporaneity with Jair. By the Middle Kingdom, if not earlier, the tomb of Jair had been converted into a cenotaph, literally empty tomb, of the god Osiris, thus transforming it into a centre of pilgrimage containing a stone image of the god, which was discovered still in place when the French archaeologist Emile M. Ninenave first excavated the burial in 1897. The tomb seems to have eventually been regarded as the alternate quintessential royal funerary memorial, the mythical burial place of the god Osiris, whose entire religious cult was intimately connected with the concept of the dead king. So, who or what was Osiris, and why is he so important to our understanding of death, mummies, and all the rest? Osiris, the god of the dead and the afterlife, is one of the earliest members of the Egyptian pantheon probably starting off as a fertility god linked with agriculture, and perhaps also the Nile inundation. Like many other major deities, he gradually acquired the attributes of other gods as his worship spread throughout the country. At a fairly early stage, Osiris seems to have taken over the insignia of the god Anjeti, from whom he also probably took the mythical attribute of deity as dead ruler. 
and Jesse's cult center, Jedu in the Delta, therefore later became known as Busiris, meaning house or sanctuary of Osiris, and was said to be the place identified with Osiris' backbone, the symbol of which was the Jed pillar. The combination of Osiris' associations with fertility and death almost inevitably ensured that he became the alternate god of resurrection, and the link with the dead kin was established by the fifth dynasty at the latest. It became essential for the mummified body to be associated with Osiris in order to gain eternal life. Ancient Egyptian texts have a tendency to allude to various divine myths through references to rituals and the use of various epithets, but their literature is notoriously lacking in straightforward narrative-style myths. Reconstructing Egyptian mythology from ancient Egyptian texts can be rather like piecing together the biblical account of the birth of Jesus from a series of Christmas cards and carols. Consequently, the myths associated with Osiris are best known not from an Egyptian source, but from a much later compilation of the legend by the Greek writer Plutarch, circa 46 to 126 AD. Some elements of Plutarch's vision have been corroborated by surviving fragments of the stories in Egyptian sources, but others may possibly be Greek or Roman inventions. He describes Osiris as a human ruler whose accidental adultery with his sister-in-law Nephthys caused his evil brother Seth to become jealous and to plot secretly against him. Seth discovered the measurements of his brother's body and had a magnificent casket made to fit him. He next organized a banquet to which he invited seventy-two accomplices as well as Osiris. During the feast, he brought forward the chest and declared that whoever fitted it exactly should have it as a gift. Having stepped into the coffin, Osiris was locked inside and the lid was sealed with molten lead. The coffin was then thrown into the Nile and eventually drifted down to the Mediterranean, washing up at the Syrian port of Byblos. This city always had strong links with ancient Egypt, particularly through the supply of cedar wood. Therefore, it's perhaps no surprise that the coffin is then said to have become entangled in a cedar tree. Osiris's wife Isis eventually rescues him and returns to Egypt, hiding him in his coffin in the marshes prior to giving him a decent burial. However, Seth is said to have stumbled on the casket and angrily dismembered the body of his brother, scattering the body parts, their number varies in different accounts from 14 to 42, throughout Egypt. Isis searches for the body parts and buries each at the place where it is found. Plutarch's version of the story claims that the phallus was eaten by the Nile carp, Lepidotus, the phagrus, and the oxyrhynchus fish, so that an artificial penis had to be manufactured. But it is noticeable that none of the fragmentary Egyptian accounts suggests this, since the first half phallus was a crucial element in the cult. The original Egyptian versions also add another episode after Osiris's dismembered body was reassembled into the form of the first mummy. They describe how Isis was impregnated by the mummified body and concealed the child Horus. This moment of conception is sometimes portrayed in a scene showing Isis in the form of a kite hovering on the mummy's penis. Versions of the scene have been found both in the shrine of Sokar Osiris in the temple of Seti I at Abydos, and also in one of the roof chambers of the temple of Hathor at Dendera. Many of the principal features of the myth of Osiris and Isis are already attested by the Old Kingdom, 2686 to 2160, including his death by drowning and the discovery of his body by Isis. The identification of Seth, the god of the desert and chaos, as his murderer was in place by the Middle Kingdom, 2040 to 1640, although the story doesn't yet explicitly refer to his dismemberment of the dead Osiris. It is the process of dismemberment, however, that provides the most telling insights into Egyptian culture. We can rarely be sure whether myths reflect ritual or inspire it, or whether other kinds of processes lie behind the surviving texts and images, but there seems to be a web of links between the myth of Osiris and the process of mummification. Herodotus' very detailed account of Egyptian mummification describes the main practitioners as parascuste, slitters, and terracute, piccolas. And although the terms are somewhat irreverent, they give a good sense of the two principal stages. The body must first be cut up and to some extent dismembered by the slitters before it can be reassembled and preserved by the picklers. <laughs>
The Osiris myth is therefore a very accurate prototype for the practical process of physical preservation. And of course, the reverse may be true, that the myth emerged as a way of providing divine precedent for the mummification process. Although the cult of Osiris permeates Egyptian funerary beliefs in various forms, there are probably two particular aspects of the cult that are most prominent and influential. The first of these is the way in which, by the New Kingdom, it became increasingly common for funerary texts to make explicit connections between the deceased and Osiris, and for the descriptions of the fate of any dead individual to deliberately echo parts of the myth. The second is the significance of the site of Abydos as a focus for private funerary cults. The survival of large numbers of private funerary stelae and cenotaphs dedicated at Abydos by a whole variety of individuals shows that the cult of Osiris became extremely popular, in the literal sense of the word, from at least as early as the end of the Old Kingdom. Even when individuals were unable to place stelae or monuments at Abydos itself, they incorporated items or images in their tombs that refer to the act of making a pilgrimage to Abydos. The idea of the imaginary journey to Abydos, described by Egyptians as a voyage in peace, first appeared in the Middle Kingdom in the tombs of the local governors of Nenanat and Knunhotep II, taking the form of painted scenes showing boats sailing to and from the cult place, while the text described the deceased man's participation in the festival of Osiris. Many Middle Kingdom tombs also contain model boats, symbolising the voyage of the body of the deceased to and from the home of Osiris. By the late Middle Kingdom, the creation of private funerary monuments at Abydos had evidently already become so prevalent that the 13th dynasty ruler Wegaf issued a decree forbidding tombs to be built on the processional way. The apparent expansion of Osirid funerary privileges beyond the immediate sphere of the royal family was once famously, and rather inaccurately, described by the American Egyptologist John Wilson as the democratization of the afterlife. Wilson and many later Egyptologists argued that, from the Middle Kingdom onwards, one's royal funerary privileges were gradually extended to ordinary people, allowing them to physically take part in the rites of Osiris and thus acquire funerary benefits that had previously been restricted to kings. Although many popular books and even textbooks on Egypt still express this view, few researchers now feel that the paradigm of democratization can seriously be applied to the gradual spread of funerary rites across Egyptian society. As Mark Smith puts it, there is no compelling reason to assume that a king's expectations with regard to the next world would have differed greatly from those of an ordinary person or that the rites performed to ensure his posthumous well-being would have taken a form radically different from theirs. Nor is there any basis for the widespread assumption that any innovations in this area must have had their origin in the royal sphere prior to being adopted by non-royal individuals. With some changes, the reverse may have been true. In other words, Egyptian mummification and funerary rites should no longer be regarded as primarily royal in origin or nature, not least because the evidence and the dating can often be so patchy that we cannot really say with full certainty at which points in time different members of Egyptian society adopted particular strategies in relation to death and the afterlife. Another old cliché, the idea that Egyptians were totally obsessed with death, is in danger of being eclipsed by a new cliché, since many recent books have made the point that Egyptian tombs contain ample evidence that they were actually obsessed with life, in the form of endless daily life scenes and models, depicting individuals working in the fields, making wine, banqueting, playing music, dancing and numerous other life-affirming activities. In reality, if we're going to caricature the Egyptians, there are good grounds for assuming that their real concerns, as in many other cultures, lay somewhere between these two extremes. Certainly in the elite sphere of society, they devoted more of their time and financial resources to preparations for death than we would necessarily consider healthy. However, it's equally certain that our view of their society has always been disproportionately biased towards the funerary side of things.
partly because cemeteries and other funerary phenomena were invariably placed in the desert and have therefore been much better preserved than their houses, towns and marketplaces. Settlements were typically located in wetter conditions closer to the Nile or other sources of water, and they have also tended to be covered by modern towns and cities, which naturally gravitate towards wetter, more fertile locations. The fact that so much of our excavated evidence relates to death and the afterlife is also a direct result of many Egyptologists' own preference for specialization in these topics. Until recently, many research agendas were geared towards funerary or religious matters rather than social or economic trends, although this situation has changed significantly in recent decades, with more research projects focusing on the survey and excavation of towns and cities. Nevertheless, the vast majority of Egyptological evidence is still oriented more towards death than life. The ancient Egyptians' attitudes to life and death were heavily influenced by their steadfast belief that eternal life could be ensured by a wide range of strategies, including piety to the gods, the preservation of the body through mummification, and the provision of statutory and other funerary equipment. The survival of numerous tombs and funerary texts has enabled Egyptologists to explore the complexity and gradual elaboration of this belief system. Each human individual was considered to comprise not only a physical body, but also three other crucial elements, known as the Ka, Ma, and Ark, all of which were regarded as essential to human survival, both before and after death. Each person's name and shadow were also considered to be living entities crucial to human existence rather than simply linguistic and natural phenomena. The essence of each individual was contained in the sum of all these parts, none of which could be neglected. The consciousness of individuals as composites of various types of identity brings us back again to the theme of dismemberment and reassembling, which was discussed earlier in relation to the cult of Osiris. One of the reasons that such themes feature so prominently in Egyptian attitudes to death is because the act of ensuring any individual's enjoyment at the afterlife was a delicate business of separation and assembly. All of these separate elements, the body, ka, ma, ark, shadow and name, had to be sustained and protected from harm. At the most basic level, this could be achieved by burying the body with a set of funerary equipment, and in its most elaborate form, the royal cult could include a number of temples complete with priests and a steady flow of offerings, usually financed by gifts of agricultural land and other economic resources. A wide diversity of surviving funerary texts, the pyramid texts, coffin texts, and various books of the netherworld present a set of descriptions of the afterlife that often conflict with one another. One scenario, for instance, envisages the transformation of humans into certain polar stars, while another proposes the continuation of normal life in an afterworld sometimes described as the field of reeds. Until recently, it was assumed that the earliest artificial mummies, as opposed to bodies simply desiccated by the surrounding sand, were those found at cemeteries such as Abydos, Saqqara and Tarkan in the early dynastic period. However, in 1997, a team of archaeologists led by René Friedman, working in one of the non-elite pre-dynastic cemeteries at Hierakonpolis, found three intact burials containing female bodies with their heads, necks and hands wrapped in linen bandages, the hold of each of the corpses being swathed in linen and matting. The grave goods accompanying these bodies dated to around 3600 BC, the early Nakata II culture, therefore pushing back the earliest use of artificial mummification to a much earlier period than previously supposed, although opinions differ as to whether the simple bandaging of parts of a corpse can necessarily be described as mummification. Intriguingly, one of the women had her throat cut after death, suggesting that even at this date there might have been a sense in which the ritual dismemberment and reassembly of Osiris's body parts was being acted out. This is not the end of the story, however. The work of an Anglo-Australian team of scientists, led by Egyptologist Janet Jones, has demonstrated that the use of mummification techniques can be pushed back even further in time to the Neolithic period.
Jones examined linen wrappings from bodies in securely provenanced pit graves in the earliest recorded ancient Egyptian cemeteries at Mostagheda in the Badari region of Upper Egypt. Using a combination of gas chromatography mass spectrometry, GCMS, and thermal desorption pyrolysis, TDPY, GCMS. These analyses resulted in the identification of a number of organic substances, such as pine resin, an aromatic plant extract, a plant gum or sugar, a natural petroleum source, and the plant oil or animal fat in the wrappings, which had been radiocarbon dated to circa 4300 to 3800 BC. The earliest of these wrappings therefore contain embalming materials, evidently made from complex recipes using the same kind of ingredients in roughly the same proportions as embalmed wrappings used in early pharaonic mummification some 1500 years later. Jones and her team have argued that the kinds of materials being used by Neolithic embalmers already show an awareness of the antibacterial properties of some of these substances and clearly already managed to achieve localized soft tissue preservation. Some early pharaonic forms of Egyptian mummification seem to have evolved simply to preserve the image of the body. Thus, some of the early mummies of the 3rd millennium BC were simply painted with plaster and paint, preserving the outer shell of the body, but allowing the flesh to decay away inside. The development of more sophisticated techniques meant that gradually more of the original body was retained, eventually reaching something of a peak in the late New Kingdom and Third Intermediate period, circa 1200 to 900 BC. By the time Herodotus wrote his detailed description of the process of mummification around the middle of the 5th century BC, techniques are thought to have already gone into something of a decline, presumably partly in order to meet the demands of mass production as mummification spread through larger numbers of the population. In 2018, a late period in bombing workshop, dating to circa 600 to 400 BC, was excavated at Saqqara by an Egypto-German archaeological team, revealing a good range of the kind of equipment that would have been used to mummify human and animal bodies at around the time of Herodotus. An open area of the workshop incorporates two large basins that may once have held natron, a type of salt used to desiccate corpses. The finds also include numerous measuring cups bearing hieratic and demotic labels and instructions. These are thought to have contained various oils for use in embalming. Once their residual contents have been analysed, it may be possible to deduce the terminology and recipes relating to some of the key embalming ingredients in use at this date. The preservation of the body by mummification was an essential part of ancient Egyptian funerary practice since it was to the body that the ka, or double, would return in order to find sustenance. If the body had disintegrated or become unrecognizable, the ka would not be able to feed, and the chances of reaching the afterlife would diminish. My own first encounter with the concept of the Egyptian ka came in the form of a Dennis Wheatley novel, The Ka of Gifford Hillary, published in 1956, which must have played a small part in enticing me towards the study of Egypt. I now know that the eponymous ghost-like phenomenon in the novel, who manages to float around solving his own murder, like the central character in the 1980s movie Ghost, is probably more of a bar than a car. But considering the many greater crimes committed against Egyptology by modern books and films, it would be a little churlish to pick on Wheatley, who had at least done a little serious research. Mummies, and their resuscitation, have a very long literary and cinematic history, stretching back at least as far as 1827, when Jane Webb Loudon published The Mummy, a tale of the 22nd century, in which the body of Cheops, builder of the Great Pyramid, is resurrected. This book essentially belonged to the Gothic fiction genre, like Mary Shelley's slightly earlier Frankenstein. Later novelists whose fiction pioneered the whole money genre include many whose names we would expect. Theophile Gautier, The Mummy's Foot, 1840. Edgar Allan Poe, Some Words with a Mummy, 1845. H. H. Ryder Haggard, She, 1887. Smith and the Pharaohs, 1912-13. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, The Ring of Foth, 1890. Lot No. 249, 1892. Bram Stoker, The Jewel of Seven Stars, 1903, and Sykes Romer, 
She Who Sleeps, 1928, and many others. One intriguing theory put forward by Nicholas Daly is that the spate of late Victorian and Edwardian mummy tales was inspired by the changing nature of the British Empire, with the mummy subconsciously representing the dangerous and exotic materials pursued by empire builders. The first cinematic rendition of a resuscitated and vengeful mummy seems to have been Cleopatra, a one-minute-long silent movie made by Georges Méliès in 1899, but the best-known feature-length film of this type is undoubtedly The Mummy, directed by Karl Freund in 1932 and starring Boris Karloff as Imhotep. In Freund's film, the body of Imhotep is revived by archaeologists reading from a scroll of Thoth. This plot actually draws on a rare example of an ancient Egyptian tale of a revived body, the cycle of Sedni Kemoiset, written in the Demotic script on papyri dating to the Ptolemaic and Roman periods. However, the principal literary source for the film seems to have been Nina Wilcox Putnam's Cagliostro. Writer Haggard She, the film version of which was written by John Balderston, who had also scripted The Mummy, and Conan Doyle's The Ring of Thoth were both also possible influences. Since the 1930s, there have been numerous other mummy movies, in fact enough to have established this as very much a genre in its own right, Probably best not even to discuss Alex Kurtzmer's 2017 remake of The Mummy, for which Tom Cruise received a Golden Raspberry as Worst Actor, and Kurtzman was nominated as Worst Director. In discussing mummies, we can hardly ignore the continual association in literature and films, particularly in the 20th century, between mummies and dreadful curses, usually affecting the archaeologist who is disturbed an Egyptian corpse's rest. Where did this all start, and more importantly, is there any truth in it? One answer to the second part of the question is that, if these curses genuinely existed, then I, and several of my Egyptological colleagues, would surely have long ago succumbed to the kind of mosquito infected cut that polished off Lord Carnarvon shortly after the opening of Tutankhamun's tomb. As for where it all started, there were certainly ancient Egyptian funerary inscriptions that included threats against those who might damage or neglect the tomb in some way, so there is very early evidence of a kind. However, if we want to find someone to blame for promoting the idea that such curses actually worked, then the name that springs immediately to mind is the Egyptologist Arthur Weigel who was reporting as a journalist for the Daily Mail during the first few weeks of the removal of funerary equipment from Tutankhamun's tomb. As if the discovery in itself was not sufficiently exciting, Weigel seems to have hit upon the idea of mentioning the curse, although planning not to believe in it himself, as a way of spicing up his dispatches. The first novelist to use the mummy's curse as part of a narrative was probably Louisa May Olcott, the writer of Little Women, who published a story called Lost in a Pyramid, or The Mummy's Curse, in 1869, so Weigel would have been able to draw on a good fifty years of fictional material on this theme. The pairs of cow's heads with huge curling horns depicted at the top of the Nama palette are part of the imagery of an early cow goddess named Bat, who was patroness of the seventh known province of Upper Egypt. She's a rather poorly known deity, partly because by the Middle Kingdom her cult had been absorbed into that of another much more prominent cow goddess, Hathor. Unlike Hathor, who might be represented as a cow or cow-headed woman, Bart was portrayed, on the rare occasions that she appears in Egyptian art, with a body in the shape of the sistrum, a rattle-like musical instrument characteristically played by women. The body is not visible on the Nama palette, but Bart is described in the pyramid texts as with her two faces, which would tie in with her double representation on either side of the palette. Throughout the history of Egyptian religion, the cults of minor deities were continually being absorbed into those whose worship was more widespread or more favoured by the kings of that time. As Eric Hornung, one of the most influential researchers into Egyptian religion, has pointed out, in their constantly changing nature and manifestations, the Egyptian gods represent the country's temples, which were never finished and complete, but always under construction.
Hornand also argues that there was probably a form of monotheism underlying the superficially polytheistic Egyptian religion for much of the Pharaonic period. The cow's heads of Bat are an appropriate starting point for a consideration of Egyptologists' views on ancient Egyptian religion, given that images of hybrid animal-headed or bird-headed deities are usually the first ones that come to mind. It's noticeable also that these elaborate deities made up of human and bestial body parts appear to interact directly with at least some of the human population of Egypt. One of the most important differences between our worldview and that of the Egyptians lies in the field of metaphysics. We make a clear distinction between the natural and supernatural worlds as part of our inheritance of Greek philosophical thought, whereas the Egyptians saw both deities and humans as interacting on the same social and physical planes. If ancient Egyptian culture as a whole is often difficult to comprehend, then Egyptian religion is among the most problematic topics that Egyptologists have been obliged to tackle. A great deal of surviving Egyptian art is connected with religion, but usually it's much easier to describe and to categorize than to analyze or interpret effectively. The many questions that Egyptologists have had difficulties in answering conclusively include the following. Did Egyptians actually imagine their deities to exist in the real world as hybrids of human and non-human characteristics, from the surprisingly plausible rendition of the god Horus as a falcon-headed man, to the rather less convincing, to our eyes, representation of the sun god Kepri as a man whose head is entirely replaced by a scarab beetle? Or did they simply create these images as elaborate symbols and metaphors representing the characteristics or personalities of their deities? When we're shown a jackal-headed figure embalming the body of the deceased, are we supposed to believe that Anubis, the god of the underworld, was actually responsible for all nonifications? Or are we being shown a priest in Barna wearing a mask allowing him to impersonate the god? And if so, was he then regarded as actually becoming the god, or simply imitating him during the ritual? There is one surviving full-size pottery mask in the form of Anubis's jackal head, now in the Pelasaeus Museum, Hildesheim, but this does not really solve the series of problems. Part of the urgency with which Egyptologists tend to attack such questions probably derives from our desire to find out whether the systems of thought at ancient Egypt were fundamentally different from our own, or whether they just appear so because they're expressed in ways that are now very difficult to interpret. When most scholars write about Egyptian religion, they focus principally on the archaeological remains of what appear to be sacred structures, and on the textual and iconographic clues to theological thought. Barry Kemp makes the point that most of our knowledge of Egyptian temple religion is concerned with the symbolism and ritual of the large state temples, whereas we still know relatively little about the ways in which such buildings were used by people, whether priests, scribes, or normal members of the population. The masses were evidently rarely allowed to penetrate beyond the temple's outer courtyards, relying on festivals when deities' images were sometimes carried from one shrine to another. These were the rare moments when normal Egyptians were able to gain any physical interaction with the cult images. For many Egyptologists, this has led to the assertion that Egyptian religion was founded on the concepts of secrecy and revelation, both of which were bolstered and elaborated through myth, ritual, and temple architecture. It was in the course of rituals, festivals, and dramas that the divine reality seems to have been constantly acted out or actualized. Ritual and regular celebration of festivals were ways of repeatedly reinforcing the links between myth and reality. Each temple was therefore not simply the home of one or more deities, but a set of rooms connected with the performance of rituals and festivals. In a sense, the temples simply served as a means of channeling and recording the movements of offerings and divine images in and out of the various shrines. The history of Egyptian religion was at one stage concerned principally with the beliefs and temples of the Pharaonic period. Now, it's become increasingly clear that, as with the rest of Egyptian culture, there is a significant prehistory of Egyptian religion that needs to be documented and analysed if the later material is to be properly understood.
At the Neolithic site of Nabta Playa in the western desert, around 100 kilometers west of Abu Simbel, for instance, circular and linear arrangements of small standing stones were identified in 1992 and later moved to the Nubian Museum Aswan in 2008 to protect them from vandalism. These alignments of stones indicated that monuments oriented to astronomical phenomena, the cardinal points and the summer solstice, were already being created as early as 4000 BC. Alongside one of the alignments were found two tumuli covering burials of long-horned bulls, while further cattle burials, surrounded by large stones, were discovered in one of the bodies leading into the Nabta Playa Depression. All of this strongly suggests that some form of cow-bull cult already existed among the cattle-herding people of the Egyptian deserts in the early 4th millennium BC, evidently prefiguring both the emergence of such cow goddesses as Bat and Hathor and the very strong associations between Egyptian kings and bulls. Comparisons between female figures in early prehistoric petroglyphs, pre-dynastic female figurines, and some of the religious motifs of the pharaonic period appear to show a high degree of continuity in the iconography, although it would be simplistic to assume that the use of similar icons or artistic themes is necessarily an indication of long-term connections in the underlying religious beliefs. In 1985-9, Archaeology provided one intriguing insight into the crucial phase of religious development towards the end of Egyptian prehistory. Excavations in a section of the pre-dynastic town of Hierakondolis, locality HK-29A, revealed a large area interpreted as an early religious complex, probably incorporating a parabolic courtyard, a colossal divine image of some kind, a ceremonial gateway, and four large post holes, which may show the location of a monumental facade, all dating to Nakada 2b to 3a, circa 3600 to 3350. As with the Nabta player remains, there were copious traces of butchery and feasting in association with this early ritual structure. Acts of animal sacrifice and the piling up of offerings to the gods seem to have been crucial elements of the early religion of Egypt, and in later times they still dominate Egyptian worship. Fresh excavations as HK-29A in 2002 and 2008 revealed a large wooden palisade wall, suggesting that the complex was only one part of a monumental compound, potentially covering an area of over a hectare. More recent work at Hierakondolis has also revealed that other large wood column structures associated with elite burials and therefore perhaps intended for enactment of funerary rites were built at around the same time as the HK-29 ritual area. Similar early wooden pillared ritual structures were excavated at the sites of Mahasna and Nakada in the early 2000s, suggesting that Hierakompolis HK-29A was not an isolated instance of early temple architecture. These strong early associations between temple courtyards and the provision of offerings and sacrifices continue to dominate much of the pictorial and textual decoration of later Egyptian temples. Many of the texts inscribed on the walls of temples throughout the Pharaonic and Greco-Roman periods are connected with the listing of the nature and quantity of offerings delivered to the god shrines. For instance, the walls of Medinad Habu, the mortuary temple of Ramesses III, are decorated with 71 offerings, the largest surviving set of offering lists in any of the New Kingdom royal mortuary temples. The most frequent kind of offering was bread, Indeed, the hieroglyph meaning offering was a depiction of a loaf on a mat, with lists of more than 5,500 loaves and 204 jars of beer being offered every day. The loaves were of several different types, the most common being round pesen and tapering cylindrical moulded bit. This is one of the rare occasions where a fruitful connection can be made between the textual and archaeological sides of ancient Egypt since sherds from the cylindrical bit bread moulds have been found in abundance at Medinat Habu and other religious sites. These bit loaves seem to have been more closely associated with religious festivals than standard forms of bread.
If the provision of offerings represents a relatively familiar aspect of Egyptian religion for the modern Western observer, there's another recurrent aspect of many of the religious cults that Egyptologists of the late 19th and early 20th century frequently preferred to ignore, or at least gloss over. This was the tendency towards phallocentrism, involving cults dedicated to very obviously ithyphallic gods, especially Min and Anun. Although Egyptian art shied away from depicting the sexual act, it had no such qualms about the depiction of the erect phallus. Indeed, as Ton Eyre points out, a celebration of the phallus is one of the central iconic foci of Egyptian religion from pre-dynastic days through the Roman occupation. The three oldest colossal religious statues in Egyptian history, found by Petri in the earliest strata of the Temple of Nen at Koptos, and now in the Ashmolean Museum Oxford and the Egyptian Museum Cairo, were essentially large ithyphallic representations, probably representing the fertility god Nin. The dating of these statues has proved to be difficult and controversial, but they're thought to be no later than circa 3100 BC, the time of Nana, this celebration of the phallus appears to be directly related to the Egyptians' concern with the creation and sustaining of the universe, in which the kin was thought to play a significant role, which was no doubt one of the reasons why the Egyptian state would have been concerned to ensure that the ithyphallic figures continued to be important elements of many cults. Such is the kin's domination of the evidence for religion in the pharaonic period that some Egyptologists have suggested that virtually all Egyptian state-controlled religious cults are, in some sense, also designed to focus attention on the royal person. This situation is probably best expressed by the one phrase that suffuses a great deal of Egyptian religious practice, the so-called offering formula. This phrase occurs at the beginning of lists of types of offerings and consists of the words hetep dinesse, an offering that the king gives. In other words, each individual's acts of worship and offering to deities were circumscribed by his or her links to the king. The falcon god Horus is one of the most prominent images on the front of the Nama Palace, suggesting that the king, who was very much identified with Horus, was already playing a central role in the celebration of religious cults and worship in the First Dynasty. It might also be argued that part of the overall purpose of the Nama Palette was to serve as a kind of elaborate reference to the king's role in the act of providing the gods with offerings, which might consist of anything from fruit to slaughtered enemies or prisoners of war. There are a number of constantly repeated iconographic themes in the palette's decoration. First, the king smiting a foreigner. Second, the siege and capture of settlements. Third, the binding up of prisoners and their execution, and fourth, the offering of the spoils of war to the Egyptian gods. These acts can all be encompassed within a very simple theme in which the role of the Egyptian king was to fight battles on behalf of the gods and then bring back the prisoners and booty to dedicate to the gods in their temples. In much later periods, royal military campaigns in Nubia and Syria Palestine are portrayed on temple walls with a very similar sequence of episodes. A crucial distinction needs to be made between the earlier discussion of the emergence and development of cults, shrines and temples, and, on the other hand, the surviving records of Egyptian ideology and codes of social behaviour. The owners of tomb chapels in the Old Kingdom seem to have already felt a need to assert their moral right to the monument that was ensuring their enjoyment of the afterlife. Each of them would therefore claim that the tomb had been built on new ground, and that the craftsmen had been paid, and so on. Gradually, however, these more pragmatic down-to-earth statements were supplemented by moral assertions. The accepted code of social behaviour and the distinction between right and wrong during the pharaonic period both tend to be closely intertwined with funerary beliefs and cultic requirements. The earliest indications of Egyptian philosophical and ethical ideas can therefore be found embedded in funerary texts. These, at first, took the form of various statements included along with the offering formula, particularly on the so-called false door steel 
and later as elements in text conventionally described as the autobiographies of individuals, such as those of Harkuf at Aswan or Antifi at Noana, in which the deceased typically listed his or her good words. Antifi, one of the few elite individuals whose life story has survived from the first intermediate period, says, I am an honest man who has no equal, a man who can talk freely when others are obliged to be silent. The whole of Upper Egypt died from hunger, and each individual had reached such a state of hunger that he ate his own children. But I refused to see anyone die of hunger in this province. I arranged for grain to be lent to Upper Egypt, and gave to the north grain from Upper Egypt. And I do not think that anything like this has been done by the provincial governors who came before me. Antifi is undoubtedly keen to establish links between his achievements as a local ruler and his moral authority. These funerary texts tend to be primarily concerned with justifying and vindicating the acts of individuals within an ethical context. A number of practical statements of Egyptian ethics have survived in the form of the Sabbath, literally teachings or instructions, each comprising a series of maxims on the way of living truly, which were mainly written on papyrus and date from the Old Kingdom to the Roman period, circa 2500 BC to AD 325. The oldest surviving examples of these documents describe the qualities required of a man in order to ensure success both in his lifetime and in the afterlife. Individuals were expected to satisfy their superiors and to protect those who were poorer. The earliest known Sabbath is the text said to have been composed by the 4th dynasty sage Hajidef, circa 2525 BC, while another such document was attributed to Tahotep, a vizier of the 5th dynasty ruler Jadkara ACC. It's likely that very few of these instructions were written by their purported authors, and many, including that of Hajidev, were almost certainly composed much later than they claim. The instructions retained their popularity throughout the pharaonic period, two of them being attributed to kings. From the 2nd millennium BC onwards, however, the code of ethics described in the Sabbat was less worldly tending to measure virtue more through piety to the gods than through material success. The two most important surviving instructions from the Greco-Roman period are the Sayings of Anxioshonki, British Museum EA 10508, and the maxims recorded on papyrus in Singer, Rijksmuseum Leiden, which were both written in the Demotic script, consisting of much shorter aphorisms compared with the Sabbat of the Pharaonic period. Central both to Egyptian ethics and to their religious thought was the concept of mad, a term often translated as truth or harmony, which harked back to the original state of tranquility at the moment of the creation of the universe. Hornung argued that Egyptian religion was among the first attempts to answer universal questions. Along with the Sumerians, the Egyptians deliver our earliest, though by no means primitive, evidence of human thought. As far back as the 3rd millennium BC, the Egyptians were concerned with questions that return in late European philosophy and that remain unanswered even today. Questions about being and non-being, about the meaning of death, about the nature of cosmos and man, about the essence of time, about the basis of human society and the legitimation of power. The Nanan Palette was initially interpreted as a historical document recording a number of military successes over foreigners or lower Egyptians by means of which the first unification of the Egyptian state was achieved. More recently, however, it's been suggested that the relief decoration simply depicts a number of rituals, probably relating to the kingship, enacted in the year that this palette was brought as an offering to the temple or chapel. Egyptologists have interpreted many other aspects of the ceremonial palettes and mace heads in a variety of ways. Just as the Nana palette was frequently given a very literal narrative interpretation, so the Nana mace head was once widely regarded as a memorial of the king's marriage to a northern princess. This theory relied primarily on the assumption that a depiction of a beardless figure in a carrying chair was a representation of the royal bride but it has been pointed out that the seated figure might be the image of a deity and not even necessarily a female one. Theories such as these are good instances of the ways in which Egyptologists analyze and interpret their raw data, 
often producing images of the past that subconsciously reflect their own contemporary social or political contexts. Egyptology has been heading rapidly in numerous different directions for some time, and it's currently impossible to predict which of these will ultimately be the more fruitful, exciting, or problematic. One thing that can hardly be ignored, however, is the fact that ancient Egypt is no longer simply the relatively obscure object of academic research. It is very much out there in the public domain, and there are any number of alternative Egypts, which, for better or worse, sit alongside what we might like to regard as the authentic original. The players in this process of reinventing Egypt for different audiences and purposes range from journalists and artists to film producers, musicians, advertising executives, pyramid idiots, and, of course, university lecturers and museum curators. In this recycling and exploitation of the ancient Egyptian database, some aspects of the culture and history have tended to appeal more to different ages or audiences. The growing dichotomy between the serious study of Egypt and its popularization was recognized as early as 1864 by Auguste Mariette, commenting on the first Egyptian museum of antiquities which he had himself created only a year earlier. Certainly, as an archaeologist, I would be inclined to blame these useless displays that do not do science any good, but if the museum thus presented appeals to those for whom it is designed, if they come back often and in so doing get inoculated with a taste for the study, and I was going to say the love of Egyptian antiquities, then I will have achieved my goal. The modern non-Egyptological view of ancient Egypt is a dense patchwork built up of mummy mysteries, Hollywood epics, Neil Age pseudo-scientific blockbusters, tacky tourist souvenirs, and also a few enduring icons, human faces and artifacts that have been plucked out of their original ancient context and left to float in a postmodern vacuum at the whim of the observer. In this chapter, I would like to examine the phenomenon of Egyptian mania, whereby the flotsam and jetsam of ancient Egypt have somehow been washed up in the early 21st century, ending up in unexpected heaps scattered across our modern cultural landscape. One of the most obvious topics of fierce interpretive debate over the years has been the question of why the pyramids took the form that they did, and what this suggests about the purpose that they served. This pyramidology is virtually a subject in its own right. Attention is focused not only on the shape, but also on the precise size and spatial disposition of pyramids, as well as the detailed internal arrangement of the chambers, and the meanings of the texts inscribed on some of the internal walls. It almost goes without saying that many of the theories advanced have been among the least plausible or logical in the history of Egyptology, owing to the well-known effect that pyramids seem to exert on the mental faculties of some researchers and enthusiasts. Not surprisingly, the choice of explanations at different points in time can tell us as much about the researchers as the problem. A useful starting point is the very common sense explanation that the pyramidal shape is the most structurally sound way of building as high a monument as possible, with the most efficient use of building resources and greatest likelihood of long-term stability. For many people, this has the disadvantage of ignoring the possibility of both a. the colonization of Earth by aliens from outer space, and b. the existence of a previously unsuspected civilization that already flourished thousands of years before the conventional emergence of ancient Egypt. It was also once seriously suggested to me that the pyramids had not been built, but that they'd been created by quarrying away all the surrounding stone, this doesn't actually explain their shape, but is a good example of the apparently inexhaustible thirst for explanations of pyramids that are imaginative rather than logical. A very long-lasting myth about the pyramids connects them with the biblical story of Joseph. As early as the 5th century AD, the Roman writer Julius Honorius suggested that they were Joseph's granaries. In 1859, John Taylor put forward the theory that the Great Pyramid was built by non-Egyptian invaders acting under God's guidance. Arab writers in the Middle Ages had a theory that the pyramids were built at the time of Noah's Flood in order to act as repositories of Egyptian wisdom and scientific knowledge. The one thing that all of these suggestions have in common is their assumption that the pyramids were, in some way, linked with the role played by Egypt in the Bible, since many of the early scholars studying Egypt were theologically motivated. 
The great Victorian enthusiast Charles Piazzi Smith, Astronomer Royal of Scotland and Professor of Astronomy at Edinburgh University, managed to combine both biblical and astronomical approaches in his pyramid research. Heavily influenced by the theories of the aforementioned John Taylor, who argued that the measurements of the pyramid amounted to a kind of slide rule record of the proportions of the world as a whole, Piazzi Smith surveyed at Giza in 1865 and declared that the Great Pyramid had been built at just the correct size in pyramid inches to exactly encapsulate the circumference of Earth, which, according to Taylor, the Egyptians were able to calculate through their knowledge of Pi. Piazzi Smith then argued, in his three-volume Life and Work at the Great Pyramid, published in 1867, that the pyramid inch was also the unit of measurement used by the builders of Noah's Ark and Moses' Tabernacle. Since the pyramid inch was conveniently virtually the same as the British inch, it was only a small step further to suggest that all this identified the British as the lost tribe of Israel, which neatly adds rampant Victorian imperialism to Piancy Smith's bundle of influences in his ruminations on pyramids. Among the more recent discussions of pyramid form and purpose are those that emphasise the undoubted astronomical links of the pyramids. It's long been suggested that the so-called air vents in the Great Pyramid served some astronomical function, since they are evidently carefully aligned with various stars, including the constellation of Orion, known to the Egyptians as Sa, which might have been the unintended destination of the king's bar when he ascended to take his place among the circumpolar stars. Kate Spence has suggested that the architects of the pyramids may have aligned their signs with the cardinal points by sighting on two stars rotating around the position of the celestial north pole, Beta Ursi Minoris and Zeta Ursi Majoris. A significant problem with Spence's theory, however, is that these stars would have been in perfect alignment in 2467 BC, whereas the most recent radiocarbon dating, as discussed in Chapter 3, suggests that Khufu's reign was about a century earlier than this day. Her hypothesis is nevertheless supported by the fact that inaccuracies in the orientations of earlier and later pyramids can be closely correlated with the degree to which the alignment of the two aforementioned stars deviates from true north. Several well-publicized books have focused particularly on the so-called Orion mystery which is the suggestion that the layout of the three pyramids at Giza was intended to symbolize the pattern of the three stars making up the belt of Orion. The tendency of such books to focus on the undoubted astronomical elements in pyramid design allows the writers to introduce speculation concerning the possible involvement of extraterrestrial beings in pyramid construction, which can conveniently tap into modern popular cultural ideas such as those presented in the 1995 film Stargate. In the late 1960s, Eric von Däniken's bestseller, Chariots of the Gods, argued that there had been extensive extraterrestrial influences on early human cultures. Since then, only a few writers have gone so far as to claim that aliens may have built certain monuments, but the exploitation of astronomical aspects of the pyramids by researchers such as Robert Bovar and Graham Hancock allows them to at least imply some kind of outside intervention. Most Egyptologists argue that the real reasons for the physical form that the pyramids take must lie within the sphere of the Egyptians' own religious and funerary beliefs, as expressed in their texts and visual imagery. One possibility is that both the step pyramid form and the true pyramid represent the primitive mound of sand piled up over the earliest pit graves, perhaps also associated with the primeval mound of creation. Certain passages in the pyramid text, inscribed on interior walls of pyramids from the late 5th dynasty onwards, support the interpretation of the step pyramid, the earliest style, best exemplified by the 3rd dynasty pyramid of King Joseph at Saqqara, literally as a stairway up which the king could ascend to take his place among the stars. Elsewhere, the pyramid texts mention the king treading the rays of the sun in order to reach heaven and the true pyramid might possibly therefore symbolize the rays of the sun fanning down to earth. The previous suggestions all fall within the familiar rationalist pattern, whereby Egyptologists use ancient data to explore the ways in which the ancient Egyptians themselves appear to be discussing the pyramids.
Barry Kemp has summarised the way in which Egyptologists tend to use their knowledge, perhaps more creatively than they're aware, when they attempt to reconstruct ancient Egyptian patterns of thought about such cultural phenomena as the pyramids. We can rethink ancient logic, but it creates an interesting pitfall in that it's hard to know when to stop. We really have no way of knowing in the end if a set of scholarly guesses, which might be quite true to the spirit of ancient thought and well informed at the available sources, ever actually pass through the minds of the ancients at all. Modern books and scholarly articles on ancient Egyptian religion are probably adding to the original body of thought as much as explaining it in modern Western terms. It's probably some kind of record, and perverse in the extreme, to have come this close to the end of a general book on ancient Egypt, without having provided any detailed discussion of Nefertiti or Cleopatra, clearly among the most popular icons of ancient Egypt, the other members of this select group being, of course, Akhenaten and Tutankhamun. These ancient individuals, apart from being the most fascinating aspects of the subject for many modern enthusiasts, have been foremost in the transformation of Egyptology into a vibrant part of 21st century popular culture. The ways in which these icons have been exploited can therefore give a general sense of the absorption of Egypt into the mass media. In obedience to chronological order, we should deal with Akhenaten and Nefertiti first. Undoubtedly, Akhenaten's reign in the mid-14th century BC was the most unusual religious and artistic phase of the Egyptian New Kingdom, 1550 to 1069 BC, if not the entire Pharaonic period. During the first few years of his reign, he appears to have developed an obsession with the cult of the Aten, literally the sun disk, a considerably more abstract deity than the traditional Egyptian pantheon. He built religious monuments to the Aten at a number of sites, but primarily at eastern Karnak and at Agatatan, a rising of the Aten, the latter being a new capital city, established by him on supposedly virgin ground at the site now known as Amarna in Middle Egypt. It is Amarna that has given its name to the period encompassing the reigns of Akhenaten and his brief successors. Because Akhenaten and his activities were reviled soon after his death, virtually all of his monuments were dismantled, and his name was erased from those that remained. Consequently, it was not until the work of 19th century archaeologists that the history of the Amarna period began to be reconstructed from the many surviving fragments. It's interesting to trace views of Akhenaten from the early 20th century onwards. Initially, his stock is high, and Arthur Weigel's biography of the king paints him as the founder of a religion so pure that one must compare it with Christianity to discover its faults, while Thomas Mann makes him the hero of his romantic novel Joseph. But by the 1950s, Eberhard Otto was describing him as egocentric, ugly, and despotic, and in the 1980s Donald Redford argued that Akhenaten destroyed much, he created little. Akhenaten, whatever else he may have been, was no intellectual heavyweight. The high profile of Akhenaten in modern times is not so much because of any particularly detailed awareness of the architecture of his temples or his iconoclastic religious ideas, although these have had a significant impact on some more recent faiths and philosophies, such as Rosicrucianism, but because of the very striking and unusual appearance of much of the art of his reign. The king himself is shown as a long-faced, bulbous-chinned, thick-lipped and fat-bellied figure, apparently with female breasts and swollen thighs, rather than being idealized as a youthful paragon of manhood, as was usually the case with Egyptian kings. Akhenaten's own chief sculptor, Bach, claimed, in a text forming part of a rock-cut steel at Aswan, that it was the king himself who had authorized this unorthodox style of art. As in other periods, both the royal family and the elite officials surrounding the king were depicted in a similar way, thus ensuring that all those Amarna period works of art that include human figures are fairly easy to recognize. This has led to the production of a large number of fakes and forgeries of Amarna sculptures, since the exaggerated style is also relatively easy to copy and very popular with the buyers of antiquities. In the case of the Mansour private collection, a large group of Amarna pieces have been subject to intense dispute concerning their authenticity, 
In 2003, Bolton Museum paid almost half a million pounds for a large fragment of a statuette of an Amarna princess, which had been authenticated by specialists at Christie's and the British Museum. By 2007, the sculpture had been revealed as a fake and turned out to have been created in only three weeks in a garden shed at the home of forger Sean Greenhall in Bromley Cross, Bolton. There's also said to have been a stronger sense of freedom and creativity in Amarna art although this perception is no doubt partly the result of the changes in religious subject matter and the survival of an unusual number of paintings from within houses and palaces as opposed to temples and tombs. It's not clear whether the artistic distortions of Amarna portraits constitute a realistic record of Arkhanathan's appearance, which would imply that he suffered from some form of disease, or whether there is a more symbolic reason for his androgynous appearance, perhaps relating to an attempt to personify both male and female aspects of fecundity. Some Egyptologists have suggested, for instance, that the bisexual features of the Amarna style human figures might echo the form of Hapi, the god of the Nile inundation, whose body was deliberately intended to convey the idea of both male and female fertility. The first full blown attempt to explain Akhenaten's appearance medically was the proposal by Sir Grafton Elliot Smith that the king may have suffered from Frulich's syndrome, an endocrine disorder which can have such physical effects as obesity, delayed puberty, and small testes. The disadvantage of this solution is that sufferers from this syndrome are also usually not only intellectually disabled, but incapable of producing children. The latter certainly does not seem to have been the case, given that Arkhenaten had at least six daughters by Nefertiti and two further girls who seem to have resulted from incestuous relationships between the king and his own children. An alternative suggestion, first put forward by the Canadian Alwyn Burridge, is that Arkhenaten might instead have suffered from Marfan's syndrome. Quite a good case can be made for the latter, which is a severe disorder caused by a single abnormal gene, given that the symptoms include a pigeon chest, a wide pelvic area, elongated skull, spidery fingers, and a long face with protruding chin. There are still, however, many Egyptologists who, quite rightly, argued that such physical and medical theories take the appearance of the art far too literally and that the peculiarities of the representations of the Amarna royal family might have lain much more within the realm of symbol and metaphor. The likelihood that we are dealing with a chosen style rather than a physical condition is backed up by surviving depictions of Arkhenaten in the early part of his reign, which show him with the standard idealized features more reminiscent of his father. All of these factors have the effect of making Akhenaten, his wife Nefertiti, and the Amarna period endlessly fascinating to the modern observer. There are any number of mysteries about the period, and constant opportunities for speculation on such topics as why Nefertiti disappears from the records before the end of Akhenaten's reign, or whether she perhaps reinvented herself as the ostensibly male ruler Smenkara, who endured a very brief period of joint rule with Akhenaten at the end of the Amarna period. What about Akhenaten's ideology and personality? Was he a saintly monotheist who anticipated or even precipitated the rise of the Jewish faith? Or was he an unreasonable tyrant who almost ran the Egyptian economy into the ground, or all of the above at the same time? One of the other burning questions concerns the fate of the corpses of the entire Amarna family. No bodies were found in the royal tomb in the desert to the east of Amarna, while the occupant of tomb KV-55 in the Valley of the Kings has been much debated, with Smenkara and Akhenaten both being suggested as candidates for the male money found there. The most recent studies of the KV-55 body, using such techniques as blood group testing, molecular genetics, and macroscopic examination, strongly suggest that the body is not only that of Akhenaten, but also to be identified as the father of Tutankhamun. In 2015, Nicholas Reeves made the intriguing suggestion that Nefertiti's remains might have been placed in unexcavated annexes, concealed behind two of the decorated walls of Tutankhamun's burial chamber. However, various attempts at prospection using thermophotography and ground-penetrating radar have produced conflicting results. It remains to be seen whether these extra rooms exist, and whether, as Reeves argues, they contain a hidden burial of Nefertiti.
It was not until the late 19th century that Egyptologists became fully aware of Akhenaten and the Yamana period, but, as John Reyes pointed out in a somewhat tongue-in-cheek assessment, the timing of Akhenaten's emergence from the shadows could not have been better. The 20th century turned out to be made for him. He could be seen as a tortured genius who took on a sclerotic establishment, a loving husband and father, an exceptional visionary and artist, a pacifist who believed in human brotherhood and a master of religious symbolism. One of the tantalizing aspects of the Amarna period is that we have an enormous quantity of artistic, monumental and textual data, and yet we still do not seem to have enough evidence to reconstruct anything like the full picture of this remarkable but relatively brief phase in Egyptian history. As Nicholas Reeves has put it, the real problem with Amarna is not so much a shortage of good evidence as a superabundance of speculation misrepresented as fact. Given Reeves' statement, it's perhaps appropriate that there have been numerous fictional rewritings of the Amarna episode, including a frightfully British rendition by Agatha Christie, Arknaden, in which one of the characters observes, Arknaden and I would never have got on. I don't believe he's got any sense of humour. He's so frightfully religious, too. There's even been an Amarna opera. First performed in 1984, Philip Glass's Arknaten was characterised by his trademark minimalist musical style. The libretto includes ancient Egyptian, Akkadian and Hebrew, conjuring up a poignant picture of Arganaten and Nefertiti as tragic figures whose spirits eventually haunt the ruins of their abandoned city at Amarna. We can add to this one of the most famous Hollywood forays into ancient Egypt with The Egyptian, directed by Michael Curtis in 1954. Based on Nico Waltari's novel, it's set in Arganaten's court and starred Victor Mature as horror man. Each of these renditions of Amarna is as idiosyncratic as the last, and the one thing they have in common is their tendency to cast Arganaten as a revolutionary dreamer and visionary. As if all the above were not enough, the Amarna period has yielded one particular artistic icon that somehow manages to combine the sexual attraction of Marilyn Monroe with the deadly controversy of the Elgin marbles, along with added racism and fascism. This is, of course, the bust of Nefertiti. The German excavator Ludwig Burghardt discovered the famous painted limestone bust of Nefertiti in 1912 in the workshop of the sculptor Fetnosa, whose house was one of the large, sprawling villas in the southernmost part of the city at Amarna. The sculpture, probably intended as a sculptor's model rather than a finished piece in itself, is about 50 centimetres high and fantastically well preserved its only flaw being the absence of the right eye, although, remarkably, this does not particularly impair its overall beauty. The circumstances by which the bust ended up in the Berlin Museum, however, have been a source of heated debate ever since. According to Nicholas Reeves, at the full division of spoils, a mere month after the discovery, the Nefertiti bust passed to Dr. James Simon, the sponsor of the German excavations. In 1920, Simon made a formal gift of his collection to the state of Prussia. Three years after that, the Queen was unveiled to an astonished public, an event closely followed by outraged complaints from the Egyptian government that the Queen's portrait had left Egypt under irregular circumstances. Accusations flew and solutions were proposed in an attempt to resolve this unhappy situation, but to no avail. If the bust arrived in Europe amid controversy, the situation became worse by the 1930s, when Adolf Hitler himself declared that it was his favourite work of art from Egypt and would therefore remain in Germany. The link with Hitler is perhaps no accident, since one of the other controversial aspects of the sculpture is the fact that it has such characteristically European rather than African facial characteristics. This has meant that, for many Afrocentrists, it symbolizes traditional Egyptologists' supposed determination to present Egyptian culture as non-African and non-black. In the catalogue of the polemical exhibition Egypt in Africa in 1996, Asa G. Hilliard III, professor of education at Georgia State University, argued, this exhibit is one of the first to select items that show more typical African phenotypes, rather than the atypical and sometimes foreign images that most Europeans like to see, for example, Nefertiti, the Sheikh al-Bilad, or Kai the Scribe. <laughs>
those ambiguous enough to be regarded as wide. The bust seems to belong to the later part of the Amarna period, when the new artistic style had settled down and become much less extreme. In the eyes of some observers, it's the most aesthetically pleasing image of a woman's face ever produced. In an attempt to analyse why this should be the case, Jeremia Marnik suggests that much of the attraction of the piece stems from its perfect, almost geometrical regularity, which is so appealing to our modern eyes. Long straight lines predominate, most conspicuously those connecting the front of the crown and the queen's forehead on profile, and the side of the crown and her cheeks on front view. Even by the standards of 18th dynasty royal women such as Ahotep I and Hatshepsut, the real historical Nefertiti, principal wife of Akhenaten, seems to have achieved unusual power and influence, perhaps building on the achievements of her influential mother-in-law and perhaps also aunt, Queen Tai. The feminist Camille Pallier paints a lurid Lady Macbeth-like portrait of Nefertiti. The proper response to the Nefertiti bust is fear, the queen is an android, a manufactured being. She is a new Gorgonian, a bodiless head of fright. Art shows Arcanaten half feminine, his limbs shrunken and belly bulging, possibly from birth defect or disease. This portrait shows his queen half masculine, a vampire of political will. Whether we agree with Pallia's characteristically over-the-top description or not, it shows the continuing power of this bust, and by extension Nefertiti herself, to evoke passionate responses. There can be few sculptures that are so closely identified with the individual depicted that commentators discuss the bust as if it were in some sense the actual woman, which is, after all, a very characteristically ancient Egyptian position to take. If Nefertiti has been exploited to some extent as a conveniently Europeanized image of Egypt, then it could be argued that something of the same sense of a bridge between Egypt and Europe can be found in the ways in which Cleopatra has been portrayed. Certainly, Queen Cleopatra the Seventh Thea Philopata, the most famous of the seven Cleopatras, long ago became such an icon and symbol of the decadent Orient that, cliché though it may be, the real woman has become increasingly difficult to find. In the immediate aftermath of the Battle of Actium and her suicide, Roman writers such as Horace and Propertius still regarded her primarily as the scheming and decadent figure who had destroyed the reputation of Mark Antony and threatened the stability of the Roman Empire. But once she was dead, they could allow themselves a little more sympathy for her. In one of his odes, Horace calls her Fatale Monstrum, which can be translated literally as death-threatening monster, but could also have the more intriguing meaning of miraculous one sent by destiny, conveying the growing sense that she was a fascinating and tragic figure in her own right, rather than simply a symbol of the slothful orient. Even without the filmic contributions of Claudette Corbert, Vivian Lee and Elizabeth Taylor, Cleopatra would probably be a close rival to Nefertiti in her popular reputation for beauty. But our real knowledge of her physical appearance is actually quite tenuous. Indeed, when André Moreau, the French Minister of State for Cultural Affairs, was inaugurating the UNESCO Nubian Rescue Campaign in 1960, he commented that Cleopatra is a queen without a face. It tends to be assumed that she was largely Greek in appearance, on the basis of her Macedonian Ptolemaic ancestry, and the fact that she is said to have learnt Egyptian certainly implies that she was probably both racially and culturally more Greek than Egyptian. Although the 14th century writer Giovanni Boccaccio's De Claris Mulieribus describes her as famous for nothing but her beauty, the portraits on contemporary coins show a woman who is distinctive rather than pretty, and Plutarch claims that her beauty was not in and for itself incomparable, nor such to strike the person who was just looking at her, but her conversation had an irresistible charm. If sparkling conversation was actually the Queen's best feature, it seems a shame that so few of her cinematic portrayals have had any humour in them. One of the few British comedies to tackle the theme of Antony and Cleopatra was the British film Carry On Cleo, 1964, which is perhaps best remembered for Amanda Barry's unusually gone next door rendition of Cleopatra and Kenneth Williams's entirely unique version of Julius Caesar. It was for me, it was for me, they've all got it in for me.
In her cinematic incarnations, Cleopatra has virtually always been played by white women. And indeed, in Cecil B. DeMille's Cleopatra film, one naive character is ridiculed for asking whether Cleopatra is black. It's presumably because Cleopatra has become such a powerful symbol of Egypt in general that there have been attempts to claim not only that she was of pure Egyptian blood, but that she was a black woman. Mary Hamer, author of a book on the myth of Cleopatra, comments, Today, controversy rages again over the body of Cleopatra, and in particular over her race. When black nationalists in the United States lay claim to Cleopatra, as they do, that attempt is surely made in the pursuit of a dignity and respect that have been denied to black families and their way of life. Countering them are mainly white scholars, who, in defense of civilization and scientific knowledge, as they put it, insist that Cleopatra could not have been black. It is primarily through the cinema and theatre, including George Bernard Shaw, Caesar and Cleopatra, rather than through archaeology, that the reputation of Cleopatra has continued to flourish during the 20th and early 21st centuries. However, Franco-Egyptian marine archaeology in the ancient harbour areas of Alexandria has revealed many submerged sculptures and fragments of architecture from the remains of Ptolemaic and Roman buildings now on the seabed. The fact that this work is popularly described, both by archaeologists and journalists, as the excavation of Cleopatra's palace is not surprising. Cleopatra is just too powerful a brand to resist. After all, both Nefertiti and Cleopatra are the names of Egyptian cigarettes. Two of the sculptures retrieved by the French marine archaeologists have been tentatively identified as Caesarian, Cleopatra's son by Julius Caesar, and another is probably Ptolemy XII, her father, it would be nice to think that somewhere on the seafloor off Alexandria there is a dazzling bust of Cleopatra to compare with the Nefertiti one in Berlin, although the face of a granite bust in the Royal Ontario Museum, widely thought to be Cleopatra, was described by the art historian Bernard Butmer as dry, bland and non-committal. In this discussion of the sculpting and deconstruction of the images of Akhenaten, Nefertiti and Cleopatra, I've concentrated primarily on the way in which they've been transformed and appropriated by artists, writers and filmmakers. Before I finish, I also need to discuss the rise of the alternative Egyptologist. From the 1990s onwards, there's been a general upsurge in New Age books and documentaries, some of which promoted maverick and non-academic approaches to the archaeology and texts of ancient Egypt. This is only the most recent flowering of a phenomenon that stretches further back than Egyptology itself, already encountered in the theories of such 19th century writers as John Taylor and Charles Piazzi Smith. Alternative Egyptologists generally use a pick-and-mix method, selecting the data they want and ignoring or rejecting other evidence that is less conducive to their arguments. This is because they often start with an answer rather than a problem or question, then they search around for the data to prove it, not that conventional Egyptologists are entirely immune from this. Such an approach is exactly the opposite of conventional, problem-oriented archaeological research techniques in which the researcher starts with a problem, for example, what did early dynastic royal tombs look like, and then explores and assesses relevant data in order to try to find one or more possible answers. One inevitable result of the pick-and-mix approach to data is that the alternative researchers occasionally use evidence that is well known or widely accepted by traditional academics. In the case of the pyramids, for instance, the information concerning the alignment of certain air shafts in the Great Pyramid with astronomical phenomena had been published by the Egyptologist I.E.S. Edwards long before Robert Bolvar produced his best-selling Orion Mystery, which suggested that the layout of the three Giza pyramids was intended to replicate the arrangement of stars in the Orion constellation, while one of the southern air shafts was aligned with the brightest star in Orion. Similarly, the visual links between the sites of Heliopolis and Giza, taking the form of demonstrable sight lines between the monuments, were studied and described by University College London lecturer David Jeffries, as well as forming part of Mulval's hypothesis. <laughs>
Within the scope of this book, devoted mainly to the archaeology and history of ancient Egypt, I've only been able to dip my toe occasionally into the vast ocean of alternative approaches to Egypt and the ways in which Egyptian ideas, motifs and stories have been reworked and reappropriated by modern artists, architects, writers, musicians and dramatists. The alternative Egypt, from Boris Karloff's Resurrected Mummy to Bernal's Black Athena and Philip Glass's operatic Hagnaten, deserves several books all to themselves. The wonderful things quote, attributed to Howard Carter when asked by Lord Carnarvon what he could see when he looked into the burial chamber of Tutankhamun, is part of the high cant charm, not only of ancient Egypt, but also of Egyptology itself. Europeans and Americans wearing pith helmets, riding on camels, posing in their Edwardian best suits outside royal tombs, and dressing up in Ottoman finery have become as much part of our modern mental view of Egypt as all the surviving ancient images. In addition, of course, our contemporary images now also draw on Stargate, Tomb Raider, Indiana Jones, and any number of video games and animations exploiting ancient Egyptian source material. Journalists often like to compare modern presidents of Egypt with the ancient pharaohs, and it's always difficult to know whether there really are any parallels buried in these media clichés. Certainly, it is difficult to imagine that the events of the so-called Arab Spring had any genuine counterparts in the pharaonic period. What we know for certain is that the popular uprising in 2011 led to the end of the very long period of Husni Mubarak's role over Egypt, which had entirely dominated my own archaeological career in Egypt since the 1980s, as well as triggering the beginning of something else in political and social terms. This is not the place to discuss the pros and cons of the brief presidency of Mohamed Morsi, or indeed the current regime led by Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, tempting though this is, but in this chapter, I would like to discuss the various impacts of these processes of socio-economic and political change on pharaonic cultural heritage, especially its archaeological sites and museums. Political Unrest and Cultural Heritage One immediate effect of the political events in Egypt in 2011 was a decline in law and order that triggered off a significant amount of looting of archaeological sites and find stores. The first real indication of any threat to Egyptian heritage arrived on the 28th of January 2011, when protesters set fire to the headquarters of the ruling National Democratic Party in downtown Cairo. Since this building was immediately next door to the Egyptian Museum, there were soon reports on television and social media that the museum itself was on fire. These rumours fortunately turned out not to be true, but the museum nevertheless became one of the most publicised looting targets, despite Egyptian protesters famously forming a human chain around it. The manner of the raid was along the lines of a Hollywood heist. A group of ten men entered the museum on ropes through glass panes on the roof, breaking about 70 objects in the process and stealing some 60 pieces, reports vary wildly on these statistics for breakages and theft, including several items from the tomb of Tutankhamun. Astonishingly, at least 25 of the stolen objects were subsequently recovered by Egypt's tourism and antiquities place, including a limestone statuette of Akhenaten reportedly found beside a rubbish bin, and four items discovered in a bag mysteriously left in a Cairo metro station less than two months later. These bizarre events have led to some speculation that both thefts and recoveries were perhaps some kind of inside job, that the real facts will probably never be known. Due to continued political instability, two years after the Egyptian museum thefts, the civil unrest was still so severe that the Malawi Museum in Middle Egypt, for instance, was stormed and totally looted by armed robbers. Over the same two-year period, many of Egypt's archaeological sites, as well as their local storerooms, each containing thousands of finds, were subject to repeated thefts. Egypt's pharaonic cultural heritage was, therefore, arguably under its greatest threat since the days when 19th-century Western visitors were allowed to strip many sites of their treasures. <laughs>
It's very important to remember, however, that although Egyptians may often have been physically responsible for the thefts, the root of the problem has always lain not with local so-called subsistence diggers, but with antiquities traders, private collectors, and sometimes even museums based in a whole myriad of places outside Egypt. As Neil Brody had already pointed out in a book written about six years before the Arab Spring, some of the worst examples of archaeological looting have occurred in countries suffering from the public disorder and economic disruption that follow the breakdown of central authority. In these circumstances, law enforcement is weak and buried artifacts are a ready source of cash for people who have seen their homes and their livelihoods destroyed. Brody was referring primarily to conditions brought on by war, such as the 1991 and 2003 conflicts in Iraq, but his comments are equally applicable to Egypt in the early 2010s, which experienced modern periods when police and security forces were absent from the large areas of the country. It's always easier to blame the looters rather than the international system that they are feeding. The experience at some archaeological sites, however, strongly suggests that cherry-picking collectors exploited the situation in Egypt in 2011-13 to to target and remove specific items. At Modi Hamanat, for instance, only a short walk from the quarries that produced the Nama palette, a rock-cut inscription was removed from a very difficult, high location on the rock face, as opposed to others that would have been much easier and quicker to remove, probably because it consisted of an unusual Persian period genealogical text. The pursuit and sale of antiquities is comparable with illegal international trade in drugs or arms, although a major difference is that the ultimate purchases of stolen antiquities very often do so openly and apparently legally, relying on so-called market nations such as Hong Kong, Singapore and Thailand that have often not ratified such international agreements as the 1970 UNESCO Convention on Cultural Property. These market nations serve as transit points, effectively laundering the artifacts and imparting legitimacy to their onward trafficking, usually at prices that are at least a hundred times higher than the money earned by the local looter. As with other countries that have been particularly affected by the illicit trade in antiquities, such as Iraq, Peru and Guatemala, the real culprits are the dealers and collectors in the so-called destination markets, and the true solutions lie not only in tighter enforcement of antiquities laws, but also in much broader aspects of international economics and capitalism. As Brody puts it, Subsistence digging will stop only when rural populations are in safe possession of their own land and are able to receive a fair price for their agricultural produce, which in turn requires the abolition of tariffs and other trade barriers. Threats to Egypt's pharaonic cultural heritage during the period from 2011 to 2014 were not restricted to theft from museums or sites. There was also the phenomenon of land grabbing, the illegal taking of land earned by the Ministry for Antiquities, either for agricultural or building projects. This took place at a number of well-known archaeological areas, such as the pre-dynastic cemetery of Tarkan and the New Kingdom city of Amarna. It's important, however, to consider the real social backdrop to these problems, especially given that many contemporary Egyptian communities may desperately need to expand, either for economic reasons or in order to create new cemeteries. Foreign missions working on pharaonic period sites sometimes also bear considerable responsibility for the situation, not only because they often fail to engage and involve local communities with their work, but also because their research is rarely disseminated locally. The unfortunate lack of resources in the Ministry of Antiquities for fully maintaining and updating records of archaeological sites only serves to add to the confusion and feelings of local disconnection. If we are to achieve a balance between conservation and the need for modern populations to flourish, more impetus needs to be put into community-based initiatives of engagement with their cultural heritage. Problems with cultural heritage and antiquities trafficking are inextricably tied up with numerous other social and political factors. It might be argued, paradoxically, that one effect of the temporary increase in looting and land grabbing in the period from 2011 to 2013 was to create a new can-do spirit among many archaeologists and other stakeholders in Egypt. 
This led to some benefits by highlighting the need for long-term cultural heritage planning in a whole variety of sites and regions. There is, however, a continued severe lack of sustainable long-term strategies for cultural heritage management in Egypt. At Esna, for example, the main tourist attraction is the Greco-Roman Temple of Knun, which is a World Heritage Site. But a report published in 2015 by Marwa Ghanem and Samar Saad indicated that the well-intentioned plan for sustainable heritage tourism, SHT, there had failed miserably. By conducting interviews with the various stakeholders, such as local residents, travel company managers, government officials responsible for tourism, and academics involved in excavations at the temple, they were able to establish some of the reasons for the failure of the SHT plan. These problems included lack of communication between local residents and officials in charge of tourism, lack of control over new building projects in the archaeological areas of the city, and the creation of a new Nile barrage in 2008, which speeded up river traffic and therefore meant that cruise boats no longer stopped for long periods to use the local markets and other amenities in Esna. In addition, the report found that conflict between different branches of local government that resulted in a failure to solve groundwater and sewage problems that were causing the temple to deteriorate. Ghanem and Saad pointed out the crucial importance in any future plan for Esna of adopting holistic, inclusive strategies that are particularly geared towards convincing the residents of the economic and social value of maintaining and enhancing their own local heritage. The desperate populace, due to poverty and ignorance, began to infringe their cultural heritage through theft to earn their living. In order for promotional activities to be fruitful, the people should be convinced that their long-term financial well-being depends on the adoption of sustainable development in the temple site. Similar problems beset attempts to create a proper cultural heritage strategy for the site of the Giza pyramids. The scheme there has so far failed, not because of any lack of money, but due partly to failure to properly consult and involve the local people. There are, however, some indications of possible fruitful and innovative ways forward, some of which are discussed by Elizabeth Bloxham and Dado Kalani in a recent assessment of best practice in Egyptian cultural heritage management. They point out the degree to which approaches to such management have tended to follow heavily Western models that are often inappropriate. Instead, they stress the need for bottom-up thinking, rather than communities responding to expert-driven agendas in which defining heritage values, often at a global scale, simply detaches local people from the process. Bloxham and Kalani point out that many of the more fruitful areas in recent years have lain within the sphere of post pharaonic Islamic cultural heritage and the few non-monumental archaeological landscapes. An example of good practice in Islamic heritage management is the Al-Azhar Park project, created by the Aga Khan Development Network, which led to the creation of a $30 million park incorporating a range of historic Islamic buildings. In stark contrast to the situation in Esna and Giza, local people in the neighbouring Darb al Anmar community were incorporated into the whole ongoing al Azhar project through financing of new local businesses and support for restoration of numerous Islamic buildings that had fallen into disrepair, thus giving residents a real economic and social stake in their own heritage. Another example of a successful, bottom-up, community-based heritage plan was developed at Aswan in 2006, when the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities created an ancient quarries and mines department, HUMD, led by Arnold Kalani. This initiative, supervised entirely by local Egyptian archaeologists in Aswan, has been building up a database of sites in the Aswan region relating to ancient quarrying and mining. But crucially, the AQMD team has also liaised with local people and contractors to raise awareness of a wide range of types of site, such as rock art and ancient settlement remains, thus helping to ensure their survival. The strategies developed locally by HUMD have enabled them both to control the issuing of official permits for modern quarrying and mining activities, and, in cases where the modern interference appears to be unstoppable, to ensure that archaeological surveys are undertaken in advance of any work.
Until very recently, the vast majority of ancient Egyptian objects on display in Egypt itself were concentrated in a very small number of large museums in Cairo, Alexandria, Luxor and Aswan. Gradually, however, in the early 21st century, a number of smaller regional museums have either been newly established or greatly enhanced, such as the Open Air Merant Town Museum inaugurated at Luxor in 2001, the Imhotep Museum opened at Saqqara in 2006, and the pyramid-shaped Akhenaten Museum at Ninya, scheduled for completion in 2021. These small local museums have often been created so as to display objects closer to the sites from which they were excavated. This has also resulted in many items from the big central collections being redistributed to regional museums in order to fill key chronological gaps. The strategy of increasing the quantity of material on display locally is designed to try to persuade organised tours to spend time and money in smaller Egyptian towns and cities that have not tended to benefit so much from cultural tourism. Time will tell whether this policy bears fruit in the future, given the continued tendency of foreign tourists to cluster in Cairo, Luxor and Aswan, or on the Red Sea coast. Some Egyptian scholars, however, have questioned whether the new provincial museums are being created within any kind of coherent overall framework, and indeed, two Egyptian museum specialists, Ma Issa and Louis Syed, have questioned the very basis of the strategy. During the past few decades, the antiquities authorities have established several museums without a clear and precise philosophy or policy on the role and aim of these museums. As a result, Conflicts of interest have arisen between new museums simply because there was no common collection policy to be followed. Fundamentally, there was no vision of the real requirements of building new museums, specifically the regional ones. During the same time that these regional museum projects have been progressing, nearly 800 million US dollars have been spent during the 2010s on the creation of a huge new project near the Giza pyramids, known as the Grand Egyptian Museum. Gem. This new national museum is planned to display over 100,000 objects in a 480,000 square meter complex, including the Tutankhamun collection, which is so far being displayed at the Egyptian Museum in central Cairo. The Nana Palace itself is no doubt also on the move, due to be transferred to the gem sometime soon, along with other iconic masterpieces. The expectation is that the gem will be visited by somewhere between 5 and 8 million tourists, based on the projection that it will lead to an increase of 30% in tourist numbers overall. Like any mega-project, it is of course not without controversy, and there are many scholars who might have preferred a major makeover on the existing neoclassical Egyptian museum in Tahrir Square, which was created in 1902, thus perhaps allowing more money to be spent on smaller provincial projects like those described earlier. The gem has also taken a lot longer to complete than originally planned. The original design was approved in 2002 and building began in 2005. However, the final opening date has receded even further into the distance, 2022 being optimistically suggested as its opening date at the time of writing. So, where does this leave us? There are some small beacons of hope in terms of museums and cultural heritage management in Egypt, but the landscape as a whole is in a state of flux and generally lacking an overall strategic framework, particularly one that is sustainable and designed to accommodate the diverse needs of local communities in Egypt. In the end, Egypt's pharaonic past is inextricably connected to its present and these two cultural spheres must gradually find better, more innovative ways in which to interact and coexist.